Hello. Wow. Ran all the way to the end of that out, our intro. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. Welcome. It's uh, the Rob Show Fake Radio uh, in a real bedroom with real grown men. And joining us today, we have Ryan Marr. Yes. Is that how I pronounce it? Yes. Ryan Marr, it. comedian it. from, uh, where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. New Jersey. You, you right. did your research. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> New Jersey. I called you Rob when I brought you on stage <laughs> by accident. There is a Rob Marr out of Maryland, though, so I thought maybe you got a little uh, confused. It happens. That's no, what happened. I honestly, it just I'm bad with names, and you're bald, and I'm bald, and you have a beard, and I have a beard, and for some reason I went, oh, his name starts with an R. It must be Rob as well. So but, then I went on that. How mm. egotistical. It's so all, it's I all good. Because you're like, oh, yeah, it's not my name. You kind of look like him, but you've been uh, put in the dryer too long. All right, so we're going to start off with hype <laughs> jokes. Today. Yeah. Right off right now. I feel like TJ's just sitting in an open mic, and it's the worst open mic ever right now. <laughs> well, I enjoy having right. TJ's here out of more. I like having TJ here. A odd character, TJ Noonan. Yeah. But uh, more out of convenience than anything. I mean, he's the only other guy I know that doesn't have a day job. <laughs> so he can sit around. I mean, I have a day job, but. I do, I too, do. just not today. Yeah. <laughs> I like TJ. He's like the walking Florida stereotype. Oh, yeah, exactly. If you can see him, he's off camera, but cut uh, off jean shorts, a tank uh, top, dirty beard, <laughs> yeah, it is and pretty a dirty. dirty ass oh, hat. Sorry about that. I just knocked over my water. Yeah, it's yeah. Closed, uh. So welcome, uh, Ryan. So how That's long are you weird. in town for? So I'll be here till Wednesday. I came down uh, staying with a friend of mine. Uh, they Two friends of mine. It's a married couple. My friend Beth, she was a stage manager for uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, a bunch of different TV shows in the city. And is her husband the one that plays guitar from the Keys? or is that? Yeah, a- yeah. Okay. Her hus- right. Yeah, so he, he was a Jersey musician, national touring musician. They just uh, moved here literally like five minutes from where we're at right now. That's why this was super convenient. Oh, cool. Gave nice. the address. And uh, hanging with them, I did some spots at Laugh-In. That's where we met. And... Uh, yeah, man, it, it's just good to be, you know, in a free country again. Well, yeah, because, I mean, <laughs> what's it like? So, New Jersey, it's locked down. I yeah. mean, but you're where do you work out of? You work New York City more well, than Jersey? So, no, I mean, Jersey is weird because, like, there's not real. I hate saying this because it's going to piss people off, but it, there's really not a Jersey scene, per se. I mean, there's some talent, but, you know, no, nobody's really pursuing comedy full-time there. Okay. You know what I mean? So, it's kind of like that whole, like, all right, well, we're, you know, there's a, there's a mic here, there's a mic there. There's a couple, like, you know, A-room clubs that I was fortunate enough to work but I was always basically a road comic. I was always traveling for work. And uh, my buddy R.C. Smith, who had moved down here a couple of years ago, he was telling me about laughing. He's like, you're going to love Jamie. So I went and I did the spots, and it was great, man, because, you know, again, in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, there's that whole thing with guest spots where it's like, oh, man, who are they going to put up? Oh, it's this guy who won a contest two weeks ago, and then he's up there talking about, oh, so I was, uh, you know, banging my stepsister's stuffed animal. And you're like, what? Yeah, I like, live at home with my parents and I smoke pot. Here's yeah, my fucking- like at least at Laugh-In, <laughs> every comic that he yeah, put up, you oh, know. That's, yeah, you're describing <laughs> TJ. <laughs> <laughs> TJ so. Sorry, man, I know you're here. Uh, but I'm no, right so it, here, was, bro. it was great. And I think, uh, and Sean Finnerty, who headlined, he said it best the next night. He was like, you know all these killers like the feature actors from Chicago like there's all these great comics yeah Paul Farvar yeah they they just don't have places to work so if they can come here and 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 work guys like J.F. Harris who have legitimate TV credits too are coming down here like you you got Artie Lang credits and you've been on TV before too people who uh you know can't get up because there's nothing to do right now up there it's weird in the summer it wasn't so bad because there were still some outdoor spots I mean I had lost a lot of work but I was able to get up and then There was this lull for about two months, and then in October, I had to do an hour uh, at this place in Long Beach Island, New Jersey, and on the 25-minute mark, I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Like, I I, I literally felt like, I can't do this anymore, so that's why when Jamie was like, I only have seven-minute spots, I'm like, perfect. Yeah, that means it's worked out great. Long Beach Island, that's where I grew up, the island next to Long Beach Island, but yeah, not known for their comedy scene. Uh, Right below it, it's uh, called Brigantine, it's actually below, man, but Yeah. um, yeah, it's... Not, I didn't know Long Beach Island did comedy, Well, period. so that's what I started doing. I had, like, a home comedy club in Jersey for many years. The owner of the club uh, managed me. I kind of separated from him, um, and I started producing a lot of my own shows in Jersey. This was a nightclub where they gave me a comedy night. It was 300 seats. So it was. it's always weird how comedy they start you off. Like, there's a nightclub, Jenks, in Point Pleasant. Okay. And I ran three shows there summer of 2018. They went really well. The next year, they gave me six. Then this past summer, they gave me nine. And I would, you know, book them. I hosted all of them and stuff like that. We had to cancel all of them because of the pandemic. So hopefully 2021 will be back. But that's the thing. It's like comedy is always the stepchild. You know, we'll give it a shot. And then as soon as yep. they see that it makes money and it went well, then they'll load you up with stuff. But, you know, I'm, I'm having is fun. Is that what you do with a stepchild? Yeah. I, <laughs> I didn't know that. I guess. Oh, yeah, there it is. You got Jenks up on the screen. Yeah, there. that's a cool little spot. You're like, I give yeah. it a so shot. It's on the beach. Oh, 
Yeah, we don't have it. That's the weird thing down here, Rob. We don't have, like, Rob's a comedian. Cool. Does He books the Laugh-In and books Fasani. And they there's no comedy on the beach down this way, which I found no. odd, especially when you have Fort Myers Beach, which is a it's hubbub perfect. of tourists. There's high overturn because it's people coming over all the time. So mm-hmm. People don't come in tours. Uh, they don't, you know, Damn. I mean, they'll come and stay in Fort Myers, yeah. but they'll go to the beaches. And most of the people that are coming and staying who aren't snowbirds are staying at the beaches. And there's and no drinking, comedy club. They, want, they want a good time. That, that, that guy right perfect. there in that picture below where he's just looking with no smile, that looks like every typical New Jersey person. Oh, I've that's, ever seen on TV. that's actually uh, that's actually no, uh, that, yeah that one right there. Uh, he's a he's a DJ. His name's Ryan Dyer, great guy, DJ HD, and he actually <laughs> did an episode See? of uh, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. This new season on Netflix, they gave him a whole episode. They gave him a makeover. He's actually a really uh, funny, talented guy. He, he's an MC and a DJ though. So what his job is like on Saturday nights. Like, you know, you can see the picture to the left right there of all the people. There's just all these hot chicks that are like, oh, well, pri- yeah, and, and they love him because he's got the tattoos and the abs. <laughs> but now what does that guy do? Because now, I mean, that's not happening right now in Jersey. No. That yeah. happened. Yeah. They'd shut it down and arrest he's everybody got, and pepper spray him. I believe he has Zoom uh, DJ. He runs like a property management company. So he's got a good day job. Oh, okay. This oh, is yeah. just like his like. I don't want to call it a hobby because he makes, you know, yeah, a money. Side it's hustle. a side yeah. hustle. But, no, thing but I mean, he, he, he's got a day job. Man, but, it's yeah. weird. Those yes. nightclubs are gone. Like, it's, I mean, it'll come back eventually, but how do you, not that I was ever one, but growing up in Atlantic City, if yeah. you've ever been to the casinos, that's all they were were nightclubs. So when you go, hey, you can't have more than 25% of people gather. And so how do you social distance grind on a girl at the quarter well, at the trop? You can't do what it. What they were doing last summer is because like, now all those walls <laughs> – open up right so okay. that you were allowed to sit at the bar spaced out but it was one of those things where it's like if you got up like i literally at one point i have steel rods in my spine so i was sitting with half my ass on the chair okay. kind of leaning and the bouncer comes over he's like you got to put your mask on and i'm like dude really i'm like he goes well if you're not sitting you gotta have, and, and i understand where he's coming from he's just doing his job because the regulations in jersey were so ridiculous where it was like if you're sitting you don't have to have the mask on if you're standing you are yeah so that's why to come here and i'm not one of these anti-mask COVID isn't real no, people. i'll wear it but it's ridiculous like oh, if yeah. I, it doesn't make any sense that you have to put it on to walk through the restaurant to get to your it's table insane. and then take it down and sit down and then you're stationary and you're sitting and talking and turning your head and that's fine but the literal walk from in when you go in to sit down well you gotta put your mask so on if you're a rascal you don't have to wear it ever <laughs> yeah you can <laughs> ever you just logic. don't have to yeah. can i ask why you got rods in your back uh so i had a, a spinal disease called kyphosis okay which is similar to scoliosis like they, it starts around puberty so i found out when i was 14 and, and i had to have a major surgery but i had complications i was paralyzed for a little bit so holy shit yeah so one surgery turned into three so yeah i mean sitting down in a chair i was never that type like if yeah. i go to a bar or nightclub i like to stand i like to walk around yeah. you know like even i was saying to my friends who i'm staying with last night we're you know hanging out in their sun porch and they're sitting down smoking cigarettes i'm like i'm just gonna stand like i i'm, I'm that type of guy yeah. so in jersey to have a bouncer be like sit the fuck down it's like all right dude come on yeah you know, like, you're also in jersey you're like well i see how these videos plowed on world story <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i fight back all of a sudden i'm taking a face full of asphalt especially i mean where was that is that point pleasant that's point pleasant. see the place. and the problem is uh, you guys don't know well maybe you do churchill because you're from the east coast yeah. the further north that you get in jersey along the beaches the more it resembles that jersey those guys from the jersey shore that everybody <laughs> assumes are us those guys are actually from like long island they're not even well, from jersey but the further up that you get the more it gets that mentality oh yeah like down by the beach where i'm from I, and you manahawk in long beach island they're redneck <laughs> it's yeah. like redneck really? surfers and yeah dive bars you start heading up that way and also you go Sir, uh, further south, like you hit Stone Harbor area in South Jersey, and you go like down to Wildwood, it gets Guido again. But in that middle, it's like real rednecky beach people. Those are my folk. <laughs> Belmar. I heard Conan call you a redneck, and I was like, what? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah like, that that happened this weekend. I, I was, was like, like, that is the further. You are the furthest. Thing at least from I running. have a neck. He just doesn't have one. Period. Oh, okay. That was good. That was he doesn't have one at all. Belmar and Point Pleasant Beach area. A lot of New Yorkers, North yeah. Jersey people, and then like you said, when you get down to Manahawk and. LBI, it's a lot of Philly people. And then Wildwood, for some odd reason, Montreal, Quebec. Yeah, it's a Wildwood's a weird place. Like man. Wildwood's, you just you got the French Canadians everywhere Wait, taking over. Rob, didn't you talk about Wildwood before? 
You, I, you, we uh, did a show and it was some kind of story. I, I don't know. Well, we, there was a kid that got stabbed on the boardwalk. And the, you ever hear those stories growing up? And then you're like, well, that's why you don't go to the Wildwood Boardwalk. Because a, a surfer kid got stabbed. They a dean something. And they started a surf foundation and a surf contest for him. Because he got stabbed and died on the boardwalk. But it was always one of the, like, it was the same thing with the girl with the beer bottle. Was or the, the gay hot dog. <laughs> was it the gay? It was, it was a really gay town? No. You sure? <laughs> Not that uh, I know of. No, I think you might be thinking of Asbury Park in New Jersey. Jersey, which which was, which was home to Bam Bam Bigelow, it, it, the greatest big yeah. man so ever it was, in the wrestling So it's home to Bruce Springsteen, who, eh, it's home to Bam Bam Bigelow. <laughs> oh, no. oh that's I Rob's favorite oh, We're going to have to fight. Asbury, yeah, right? Well, we'll get into it. Asbury has become, <laughs> um, you know, a very hipster, but it was actually the gay community. There's a club called Paradise, and it's a, attached to a nightclub called the Empress Hotel. And I forget the name of the guy who owns that hotel or started it, but he was like a songwriter for Madonna. So there's there was a lot of you know, the gay community into Asbury. Okay. And, I mean, they've made it um, amazing. It's well, Bru hey, Brucey, name, it sounds like Asbury. <laughs> <laughs> it's very fitting. And Brucey wears those tight jeans, so maybe maybe <laughs> oh, Brucey was trying to send some signals out from all the whole Asbury. Well, he was drinking in a park. They yeah. got hey, you know that. what? It, it, that, that's not <laughs> drinking. He had two shots of tequila. But, yeah, I'm I sure get it. What are you, two. 15, Bruce? You don't need to be doing shots of tequila in a park. Although it must be cool when you're at that level of fame where you're just riding your motorcycle and you stop and people Let are like, yeah, yeah, you want to get – are you going to do Bruce? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, for the rest of the show, you can only talk like Bruce Springsteen oh, now. please don't. <laughs> I know it's not my oh, show, man. but if I if the guests have any rights, let me <laughs> How long is the show? Don't let him do no that. It's only 11.50. Yeah, only 45 more minutes. And we have air conditioning. So don't, the only rest well. in this country. Um, my problem with Bruce is just that it, performing in the Jersey Shore area, I actually did a thing for uh, Nick Clemens Day, which actually became like a proclamation in Jersey. I played, uh, I'm sorry, Clarence Clemens Day. And I, yeah. played with, <laughs> I played with Nick Clemens, his, his son. Uh, yeah, okay. well, the big man. Is, and then Jake is the nephew that's in the yes. E Street Band. So, okay. but Nick, Nick Clemens put together this thing, and I did a comedy set. And I found out that it's not just for a Bruce Springsteen-oriented event. Anytime there's live music anywhere in New Jersey, on the shore especially, and look, it's very similar to Cape Coral in the sense that every place, especially in the summer, is having live music. Yeah. There's always going to be a band of five to seven assholes sitting in the audience. They're like, oh, I heard Bruce is going to show up. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and like, no, no, he's not. Why? I'd, be, I'd be that asshole. So, so the, equi you know, the equivalent go, of Jimmy Buffett and Key West. I would imagine. Basically, yeah. that's yeah. exactly what it is. All Florida. And, and, yeah. and 100%. It, you know, and it's weird, too, because there's this whole, like, angle that he's, like, the everyman. And I, the only encounter that I've had with him, believe it or not, it had nothing to do uh, with a showbiz aspect. My girlfriend at the time and I went to go see Toy Story 3 in the movie theater at the Mammoth Mall. Okay. And it was showing on three screens on a Saturday night. So it just so happened that Bruce was in our theater. We didn't know until we were walking out. And you would have thought that it was like, you know, Paul McCartney walking through the airport during the height of Beatlemania. Yeah. And I'm like, this fucking guy, he lives here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so you can't claim him to be, oh, he's one of us. And then, you well, know, also, you him like that. I, I like Bruce, but I mean, What's he going to Toy Story 3 for? Well, I he mean, has, all, he does have kids. I mean, well, this was, all right, 2000, whatever movie that, whenever that came out. But he's got a son who is particularly young, I think, like maybe only 19 you're or 20. You're also now. Bruce he Springsteen. You don't brother. have your own movie theater in that farm ranch that <laughs> right? he's got yeah. in Colt's Neck, which, by the way, it's a, a good tax write off because yeah. you get a few sheep on there, you get it designated as a farm. And then you yeah, can apparently make money. his wife's into horses or something. They have like a big stable or some shit. Well, his daughter is. His okay. daughter is a very, they have a very attractive uh, daughter, Jessica Whoa. Springsteen. Wow, he really is a fan. Up. I am. Oh, no, okay. you know what? I bet because growing up, it was. He it was either that or Bon Jovi at I the love, Jersey Shore. Bon See, I'm the opposite. I just never got it. I was like, all right, I, it, woo, we're halfway there. And then I was like, but I liked Bruce's songs. My, you know why? Because my mom grew up with Bruce, and it was the first concert that she took yeah. me to. It was the first time I got in a drunken fight with somebody with Whoa. my mom at a concert. All my fun <laughs> times with my mom. Yeah, you guys you guys definitely sound like Bruce fans. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yelling at people. Hey, here. Fuck Shut the Bruce fuck up. Everybody. I want to hear Claire. <laughs> we're the kind of fans that Bruce does tequila with. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm laughing too. No, you're, don't. You never apologize for laughing. Well, Caitlin will come in here and slip my throat. Oh, so. she, likes, she likes horses. Yeah, Good Jessica horses. Springsteen. Oh. Good looking oh, girl. Very and she like competitively. competitively. Yeah, no, she's, I've, I've heard that she's like a well-known equestrian and the son just became a Jersey City firefighter, which look, I which, respect. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because you could if you were. Be the biggest piece of shit. Yeah. You, would you, have, you could do nothing. Exactly. Exactly. That does look like someone like is like smile, you know, smile. Right uh, now. Damon Wayans, did you hear Damon? You worked with Damon Wayans at yeah. uh, uh, Visani's. Yep. Did you hear him say he talked about how he has one good son? 
Damon yes. Wayans Jr., who is out and acting and doing comedy. And then he's got a really talented son who could do anything he wants. But his son went online and looked up Damon Wayne's net worth and realized what his share was and just went, I'll just coast <laughs> yeah. until the old man yeah. fucking grows. Oh, yeah. And you could do that when Damon Wayne's is worth $40 million so and you're dividing dumb, that by four people, you get 10 mil. Fuck yeah, well, he's still got to write the paperwork on that, so I wouldn't guarantee anything at this point. Well, yeah. You but, know? <laughs> but, and the, did you see the woman he was with? No. That's oh, his yeah, long-time yeah, yeah, girlfriend yeah. and manager, the prettiest girl. Assist- Oh, it's wow. just yeah. super sweet. I was like, yeah, good for you, Damon Wayans. You yeah, know, him and I have never uh, crossed paths, but I mean, I grew up loving it. I mean, who didn't watch and live oh, in color? Fuck. You know, I'm 37 years old. I feel like if you're in that age range of 35 to, to 50, you definitely watch it. I'm right color. under it, 34, but I grew up with Major Pain. So okay. I was like, I yeah. knew Damon Wayans. And then as I got older, I became aware of In Living Color yeah. after it was off the air. But yeah. growing up, it was always. Homie the Clown. You didn't that know was what that was. Yeah, things. but it was always, that was like the. He did the homeless guy in the set of uh, the. Uh, late show for that I worked. The guy who had the pickle he the jar with the yeah. poop. Yeah. He did some impressions. Yeah. It's always cool when they pull that out. But yeah. And then when him and yeah. Keenan Ivory did Men on Film. Yep. That, he was, did. that was some oh, wild David shit. Oh, Ken David Miller Alan destroyed yeah. that yeah. night harder than anyone you said. What? Ken Miller destroyed that night. Well, like, not to talk shit about Damon no, Wayans. No, but no, yeah, but Ken, I, mean, I think Ken had 25 and he had a solid 25. Are you one of those guys that's like, oh, the national headliner for 25 no. years couldn't follow me? <laughs> no. I don't know what happened. He told me that. I wasn't even fucking there. Yeah. Not me. Yeah, I thought the the feature act the dug a yeah. little bit of a hole. I We're still waiting for TJ to graduate yeah, no, coffee shops. Uh, <laughs> What's that? We're still waiting for TJ to graduate coffee shops. I worked <laughs> yeah. with a guy in Jersey a couple of years ago. You ever like work with one of those guys? My room. What, what was that? No, don't. <laughs> right. no, go ahead. Buzzer, <laughs> please. Buzzer was down. <laughs> I was it. working with this guy in Jersey a couple of years ago, and he was like a fill-in host that the club hired. And I just knew, like, you know when you, and I'm sure you know this, when you, you know, especially as a booker, you meet somebody and you know they're full of shit within five minutes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and every comic yeah. in Fort Myers. If you stick around long enough and you talk to enough of them, every single one of them is full of shit. Yeah. Every, and, I and, could do 30, but yeah. really, fucker? So I, he yeah. starts with, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm really tired, man. You know, I was just on the cruise ship all week. And then, so I'm watching this guy set, and I'm like, this fucking guy, like, was never on a cruise ship, unless, like, you know, he paid to go on a cruise. Like, <laughs> yeah. There was just no way yeah. this guy was working anywhere. So sure enough, like he adds me on Facebook and I accept. And it's interesting because now I feel invested in his bullshit. I'm like, now I want to see the stuff that this guy posts. <laughs> okay. right? And it was the funniest thing ever. He was in, he, he posted something about how he opened for Tim Meadows at a comedy club in the Midwest. And he tagged the club in it. And he said, uh, you know, sorry, Mr. Meadows, that you had a hard time following me. Which, right? <laughs> Whoa. Even Whoa. if that were, even Whoa. if that were true, well, you know, yeah. Because he tagged it, like I tagged Laugh In Comedy Cafe the other night. So whoever runs their social media page, it's going to see it. Hopefully, I'm an admin. Oh. This, oh, okay. <laughs> this person, whoever runs that page of this club, actually commented, was like. You weren't on the show. Who are you? <laughs> so this fucking nut job must have just been sitting home looking to see where Tim Meadows was working and then puts that post on. Oh, to my God. So yeah, like, why I, would you hunt that one down? Of all the people. Yeah. Like, of all the SNL characters you've possibly had. <laughs> well, he's the Tim longest Mitch. running for a long time. Well, yeah. Huh? yeah so Can I tell you? Also most forgettable. So <laughs> I liked him. <laughs> on the uh, opposite end of that, so I watched. So I went up. I'm not going to say where it was. I'll turn the mics off. Feature act. By the way, I was supposed to be the feature act. We had a we had a movie night scheduled for Saturday, remember? And then they canceled, so I had to give up the feature weekend. So I guess I got a guy to fill in. I went up and wanted to go see Paul, the owner, and see his wife. So I was in town. I went up and I did a spot. The feature act was so bad that they actually <laughs> called another comic to come in who's a headliner who lives right up the road to go after the feature act set to go on before night. to bring the crowd back because it was 25 minutes. And you know what? I applaud that his set was supposed to be 25 to 30, and he did his 25, but it it's was admirable. silence for 25 fucking minutes. But you That's know what, though? I, so the thing is, is that he did his 25, and he got off. And what I respected about laughing, too, and again, you know, I, I've performed in Florida before. I performed in Texas. It wasn't all New York, New Jersey. But what I respected about it was that everybody kind of stuck to their time. Look, sometimes people go 30 seconds over. I'm not one of those. Talk to Shelly Kelly. She never sticks to her time. But yes, no, go ahead. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Ever. But in you Jer- trust me, you wouldn't forget if you did. No, I'll show you a photo. <laughs> you go ahead. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. In New York and New Jersey, like there's always these guest spots where it's always some asshole is going to go five minutes over. So like that's why it was refreshing to see. Holy shit. Like people were told seven. Oh, okay. <laughs> did, you, did you see her this weekend no but i'm just oh. going oh okay because I, I can imagine um 
But yeah, so I mean, it's like, you know, seven minutes, people were sticking to it. And, and we're cool. Like, look, it's seven minutes. I'll light you at six. And yeah. if you get off at 730, you get off at eight. Okay, it's fine. It's a minute over. I love Shelly. Every time it's a five minute guest set, maybe seven minutes at most. And she's on 13 minutes. Yeah, and I'm, no, and, see, but that's disrespectful. And, and after a while, it, it gets to I don't, I don't put up with it. You know, I, look, I used to work the Borgata, and there was a timer on the stage that would count down. Yeah. And so, especially when I first started, I mean, it, it was billed as a three-headliner show. I was the opener or middle. I never closed it. But, you know, so if you were opening, you did 15. If you were middling, you were doing 25. And it's 900 seats, but they want those people back on the casino floor. That's all they give a shit about. So there's a timer. And I'll never forget the one night the timer froze at, like, the seven-minute mark for, like, at least two minutes. It just wasn't moving. So finally, I just was like all right, let me feel this out. Then I went, thank you, good night. And I got off stage and the booker's like, oh, you ended early. And I'm like, well, yeah, it, it froze. He goes, I don't care. He goes, I'd rather you end early then stay up a minute over. later. Oh, goes, yeah. Because if this show goes longer than 90 we minutes, pay for that. he goes, Union I have workers. He goes, I have the managers of, you know, call, why aren't they out at the table? Yep. So, yeah. you know, it's weird. I watched, cause I don't do a lot Is of, Is that where you did it with Artie? Uh, I never did Borgata with Artie. Oh. No, I, I'd worked with Sorry. Artie at like the, the convention hall in Asbury park and stuff like that. But, it's weird because I I never I got into comedy in Florida and so the only time I've done it in Jersey is when I've gone back to visit and that's okay. been a handful of times and I know Rich Voss I had booked him yeah, for yeah, radio yeah. before I had his phone number he was at one of the at the Atlantic City Comedy Club cool little club um but it's you know it's a dance club yeah they have a high stage it's very high it almost looks like a strip club it's at very, the, at uh, the Claridge right uh I don't know what hotel what okay. casino it was anymore uh he is the headliner and people are walking in sitting down, watching the show, and then five minutes into it, getting up and going back out. And I had no idea that that's the way it works at the casino gigs is yeah. they'll just open it up, and if you want to come in and sit down and then go back out to go gamble, they don't give a fuck. They want you back yeah. gambling at those tables, gambling at those machines. Well, that's why I learned. I actually liked that. It, but it was weird the way that they booked it, too. And, and again, it's switched bookers. So then I had a re-audition, and I got back in, and then they fired that booker. So now, who knows if I'll ever be working there again. <laughs> but the one time they had me, it was uh, Mitchell Walters who just passed away. God rest his soul. He was headlining. I was middling, and the opener was a magician. But what was wild was he was doing like my, his name is Jay Mattioli, very talented guy. He would literally do like a Michael Jackson impersonation and throw his arms out, and fucking doves would fly out. Then he would close <laughs> with levitating an audience member. And you got to follow that? I had to follow that. <laughs> and I was like, why are you Jesus. having the magician open? I'm like, you know, like, and even Mitchell, right. Mitchell, you know, who's been on the road with Sam Holy Kinison shit. and everything, he's like, fucking, he should be closing. So I just had like this uh, this awful line that I came up with because finally he would close again by doing this and the birds would fly yeah. out. And then he'd go, now who's ready for some comedy? And it was weird because people either loved the fact that they were seeing this awesome magician or they hated it. There was no <laughs> <laughs> and so that I just came out and I was like, uh, yeah, I was like, would you believe? I was like, that bird shit on me two hours ago. I still lost 200 bucks playing blackjack. And then I got him kind of back. Yeah. But it was it, every night it was like, you know, because he'd be levitating somebody and people would be like, oh my God. And I'm like, now nah, I have to go out and talk about my dick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but yeah, I mean, it's exciting. You always get to work with different people and meet different characters. And that's what I like. But, uh, yeah, no, this weekend I was very impressed with how everything was running at Laugh. I would, you, well, Rob books the guest and the host spots and always does okay. a good job, minus the Shelly Kelly. But I like <laughs> Shelly, so it's not <laughs> Some not things I can't avoid, shit. all right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm required by state law due to other things <laughs> would, to make yeah, sure she yeah. discrimination. <laughs> yeah, I have to do at least you two, didn't. two a month. It's actually funny that this is happening because you mentioned Artie Lang, and just now, I guess that was seven years ago today, the first appearance, I just got tagged in a memory. Aren't these Facebook memories a total mindfuck? Uh, yeah, yeah right? but mine are always how much better life was seven years ago yeah, than well, it currently is, and then I'm like, yeah. ah, shit. Seven years ago, I was on the Artie Lang show. And now you're and in now a bedroom in, in Cape Rob Coral. Show yeah. In Cape Coral. Direct TV to no TV. Yeah, look at <laughs> the pictures of... Uh, Welcome to Twitch. Pictures. I thought she was holding a magic wand with that wire. Oh, no, there's, <laughs> I mean, have you seen, uh, Rob Churchill, have you seen, you've seen the photos of Shelly's penis, right? Oh, the, I'm not going to show you, but they're out there. She, oh, because you've already showed me some horrible shit on the show, and I've been oh, still right. scared. We showed Rob a video called One Guy, One Jar. Oh. I don't know how the topic of Two Girls, One Cup came up, but then we watched the One Guy, One Jar video, which is, well, you don't want to watch. You don't want, like, there that was looks a, like Transacula. That's <laughs> a, that's a, that's a, <laughs> <laughs> right uh, joke of the day. See, here's the great thing. In Florida, you can make jokes like that. If I was on a podcast in New Jersey and said that, I'd be fucking canceled within an hour. There'd be like a Facebook group going, oh my God, you're not going to believe what he said about one of our performers. It's a different world down here, <laughs> man. Yes, and, and you well, can, I, I literally... said performers, so whatever. You know, <laughs> I, free, I got free reign on this one, all right? Yeah, the, right. If the, running, the running joke is... 
comics use a line every time they go up after Shelly because Jamie, the owner of the Laughing, wrote it. Now people use it. I've used it. JoJo has used it. I watch Griffin butcher it. People have used the line yeah. time and time and day. Uh, I, I forget. Now I forgot the line. Wonder Woman. I wonder. Uh, it's something wonder about Wonder Woman. Yeah, I wonder yeah. if that's a woman. And the audience always laughs. And I go, if and you she's that, cool with it. Yeah. He. Oh. Well, yes. I mean, but but how does Whatever. she? What does she identify as? She identifies pansexual. Okay, Depends but I don't even know how to reference that. Then, do you? Right. Depends no, on I don't the day. either. That's the problem. Have too. you seen it's her like... as Charlie? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. She'll go out dressed like that. Okay. Go do stand up, and she did it once. Then comes off stage, takes off all the makeup, gets dressed as Charlie, who she lives as also, okay. and like goes up and does man. another set to see if the audience will be oh, able so to Oh, so she double books herself. Yeah, hey, here's, you yeah I know. It's <laughs> yeah, two yeah, slots. Yeah, it's happened a couple times. Yeah, <laughs> Two <laughs> slots. And hey, you know Genius. what? The weird part, the Charlie Greer material killed. The Shelly Kelly stuff kind of fell flat. Well, yeah, uh, because I could imagine, too, and again, not to go with stereotypes, but they do exist for a reason. I mean, you are in Florida, right? And you got snowbirds from all over the country. That are older. That, that are older. They're not going to, I mean, look, they're not going to tolerate it the way a college kid, you know, in New York yeah. and New Jersey would. And so, but that is funny that it's like two different gimmicks that they go yeah, up. Yeah, and, and it I was, like that. it was interesting She's to sit huge. in the back and watch. Yeah, she is. How tall are you? Six one. She's taller than you. Yeah, I but she wears her. nylon fake boots. I mean, so I oh, really? can't really. Oh, yeah. But I All believe right. she's like, because uh, when she was Charlie, uh, I bombed at Ollie's. Surprise. And <laughs> and um, she bought me a beer. And I, I was like, thank you. And I stood up. I was like, Jesus fucking Christ. And now, that was it was Charlie when, or Shelly? That, that was as Charlie. Right? I'm oh, sorry. Okay. And uh, he, I don't know how. Telemarketer. Damn it. I wish I was. Oh, you okay. just abruptly stopped. All right, I, I wanted know. to bring this that, up with you. That ADD moment right there was sponsored by TJ. No, I wanted, I wanted to <laughs> crack uh, the telemarketer. Quickly, before we go to your Instagram, uh, Rob Churchill, I've never met your girlfriend before. She is mm. very pretty. She yes, showed up she at, is. like, no, I don't take this the wrong way, <laughs> out of your league pretty. I was like, yes, I holy kick the cov- shit. I outkicked the coverage on that Very one. pretty girl, and I was, I, and I'm not saying that I was, surprised but i was <laughs> yeah. i was like wow look at her and i went mm, what's up mrs churchill yes yeah, yeah you, you know, just did the a lot look. of people are when they first dick, meet her but... they were all like what the fuck are you doing with him yeah well they have the same reaction <laughs> before we had kids and, and, and caitlin and i were in our prime people would look at caitlin and go what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah now that we have kids are like oh i get it i right. love how you just said in her prime like yep. you're putting down well, we're, you, we're you working on getting prime. back to that prime <laughs> You said our prime. It's a lot I of uh, peloton in that we have to do. There oh, yeah? You go. Yeah, but anyway, you're, it was very nice to meet Mrs. Rob Churchill, and I enjoyed <laughs> her company. She's a very pretty girl. She's very, very, very nice and much like a saint, and I don't know why she's with me, but I don't question it now. I just stopped questioning it. We've Maybe almost it's... Together, almost together been together five years now. Nice, so, nice. Well, And even before, I just started doing comedy. Like I just started doing comedy. To a little less than three years ago, and you're already booking rooms and stuff. That's impressive, though. Yeah. Like, so, and you're and you've kept the relationship together because usually when you start doing this, she lets me. She wanted me to get a hobby. She thought I was gonna pick the gym. I was like, "You out of your mind? <laughs> How about you? Has this ruined relationships for you? Yeah. Well, I mean, especially I, being on the road. I mean, if you're a road comic. Yeah. Well, I started in '06, and uh, I started by winning this open mic tournament, which really fucking blew me up to thinking that. Like, I was going to be a star okay. overnight. <laughs> you got to remember, though, too, this was also around the time where Dane Cook was the biggest star in the world, and he had done it through MySpace. MySpace, you yeah. know? So I, I had this open mic tournament. I was with this girl for about a month. Uh, we, she was only six months younger than me. We actually made it work for about four years, but, you know, she was a real estate agent, became a broker. She was making a lot of money, and I was a train conductor for New Jersey Transit Railroad, and I fucking hated it. I was miserable. I was yeah. working these late-night trains at a Trenton at 2 a.m., you know, asking, oh, ticket, please. They're pulling a knife on you. So I just wanted to get away from that anyway. So she was pushing for me, go, you know, pursue comedy. But then it gets to a point where it's like, all right, you know, you, you don't realize – how the business works. It's like, okay, I'm doing uh Reverend Bob Levy's comedy club. <laughs> Levittown. And, yeah, and, the Ramada <laughs> Inn. Yeah, oh, so you At know it. Oh, I, well, I used to work on the radio in Philly and okay. he used to write for the morning show. It was called the Kid Chris, Chris Show Kid Chris. on yeah. WYSP in Philadelphia. Okay. So uh, I had worked for Chris. And I love Bob, so that's not And I like Bob yeah. too. Bob yeah. was always great. He's a killer. He was a great writer for the show. We had weird characters and he would write lines for yeah. him and it was very funny, but it was always, he would always call in with his plugs for the Ramada Inn in Levittown, PA. Uh, Levy's Comedy Club. Yeah, and it was a fun club, but you know, the, so the day of, I get the call from Bob. Like, so my my girlfriend's gonna come with me. I'm featuring. Uh, I think Jim Florentine's headlining, and then the host is this kid Pat Breslin, who I love, and uh, Pat's actually married with kids and out of the business now. 
but you know, Bob calls me up there. He's like, "All right, there's a little bit of a problem with the hotel. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you, you and Breslin might have to share a room." <laughs> so I'm like, "All right, whatever." So I call up my girlfriend. I'm like, "Look, you know, I know you wanted to go to King of Prussia Mall the next day, shop, make a weekend out of this." <laughs> You know, as, as romantic as it can be when you're working the club of a guy who eats blue cheese out of one of his ass. As his closer. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm like, listen, I'm like, you know, let me get down there tonight. If there's only one room that Breslin and I have to share, you know, you can't come till tomorrow. I'll try to straighten it out. Sure enough, I get there and we did have our own rooms, but then I call her up. She's like, oh, what? now you want me to come? So it was like that kind of shit. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm, yeah. like, I'm getting paid. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm I meant the paid. Ramada in. <laughs> exactly. I'm getting $300 for the weekend. But again, it's that peaks it's and valleys. Thing. And look, I've experienced that with just not even relationships, just with friends. Like when friends come see you perform at the Borgata, and you're in a suit, and it's nine, and then you're getting comped into Murmur Nightclub, and Lil John spinning, and you have a table, <laughs> oh, and then it's like, where are you at next week? Oh, I'm at the VFW in Raw. <laughs> like, <there's no> <laughs> and you have to be able to brace yourself for that. Yeah. If you don't, you're fucked. Yeah. You know, so that's oh, why that's I never understood the ego of these guys. That you know they get a good gig, and look, I mean, maybe there were times when I was younger, especially I've been doing this since '06, that I had that. Mm -hmm. But some of these guys, it's like, guys, no, it's going to be over next week, you know? Yeah. You, wait. So you started right at the, I'm well, social media because Dane Cook was at the biggest comic at the time and on MySpace. So you were at kind of at the advent of when social media started. How much different has it made the game just for comedians now? Because now it's. Follow my Patreon. Follow yeah. my Twitter. It used to be, Podcast. hey, try and follow me on stage. But now it's literally, look at what I can do online, and then maybe I can bring an audience based on that. It, it, it's hit or miss. And, uh, you know, the reality of it is a lot of these guys, and it happens big in, in New York and New Jersey. Vic DiBetetto is a perfect example. Yeah, bread. I, go get the bread. Get the milk. Vic was a guy who killed for 30 years, right? I mean, and I, I, I've seen him kill in front of literally eight people. I mean, he would finish driving a school bus come to Uncle Vinny's Comedy Club and go up on stage and, and crush. Eight people, but crush. And then go home, go to bed, and drive a school bus the next day. So when it broke for him, I was over the moon. Because yeah. I'm like, this is a guy who's got the chops to back it up. Now... It's gone to this whole wave of any, you know, cute Italian guy that wants to go, hey, not a sauce. Yeah. Hey, grandma had plastic on the furniture. Hey, you want a real meatball? I got 25,000 views. Let me headline a comedy club. And I'll tell you, some of the guys, they pull it off. Some of them fucking tank. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it doesn't last very long. And, uh, you know, we were talking about you wanted to bring up the pro wrestling thing. I had started in the pro wrestling business as a ring announcer, manager, occasional part-time wrestler with the rods in my spine. I couldn't do too much. But I'm seeing that now. A lot of the guys that I became friendly with that went on to WWE or guys that were legends at that time doing the shows, they're getting into stand-up per se, but it's really that one-man show aspect of, yeah. I'm going to have fans that are going to come and buy. And look, if you're Jamie Morgan at Laugh-In, and I'm not saying he does this, but I'm just saying as a club owner, if Mick Foley... Well, he, do, he did it. Foley oh, was yeah. there yeah, before. A couple yeah. times. All right, so if, like, Mick, if Mick Foley... Got, if yeah. Mick Foley calls you up... <laughs> I was cooking that night. If yeah. Mick Foley calls you up and says, hey, I want to fill your club... You know, or whatever. Why are you going to say no to that? You're not going to say no to but that. But Kenny, like, that's the thing. I don't think Mick did. It wasn't any, I mean, it's. Everyone had a fun time. Yeah, but it's been a long time since Mick Foley was top of mind for wrestlers. Yeah, I mean, like, Dolph, yeah. Dolph, Dolph Ziggler sellout. does it. Dolph Ziggler does he, was He's it. He's currently no. on TV, though. Dolph, yeah, and like, that's. Regularly. But Dolph will come do down and do that stuff, and he'll, he'll fill a room. But there's a lot of those YouTubers that'll go and. Hey, I'll be here. I mean, there's a club in town that'll book YouTubers for the weekend, and I always go, mm, "How much time are they doing? Can they do the full 45?" But if it's is it somebody that was doing YouTube and then went, "Hey, I can parlay this into a live appearance. Where can I go to do this? A comedy club? Yeah. Boom! I'll just go tell 20 minutes of YouTube stuff or TikTokers." Now, like, did you see the girl who's like the female Jim Carrey? Heather Shaw, but she's also a very funny. Oh, comedian. really? Yeah, see, I didn't know that. For, out of Orlando, yeah, very I, I funny. Yeah, you got to do your research when you see these people because you, yeah, you know, sometimes like so she's it, actually funny because yeah, I, I was like, dude, she can parlay this. I I didn't know that she. Oh, used. she's been doing stand up for longer oh, than I have. Awesome. Out of Orlando too, where it's a nice network that you can. It's I don't know what it's like up in New York now. In Orlando, you can at least get on stage once a night anywhere, any night. Uh, some nights there will be multiple spots, but there's only one club in town. That's the weird part. All that comedy, and there's one comedy yeah. club. The New York, improv. for me, was always a pain. I mean, I was past at Dangerfields and stuff, but, you know, again, nice. the politics of this business, 
you know, the woman who booked uh, Dangerfields at the time, I had an audition and Tony, the owner, was there. But the woman, she, you know, does soap star meet and greets. Like, that's like her big thing. <laughs> okay. And she's got like six or seven clubs, like in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And you got to kiss her ass. And, and I'm like, I, I, she flew me out to San Antonio. Well, I flew myself out. I had a, a week there. And I'll never forget, we were staying in a condo, myself and Manny Oliveira, the other comic, great guy. And I, I pulled down the bed sheets you know, to take a nap after just flying cross country and there were dry jizz, jizz oh. all over. <laughs> So I called this woman up who oh. books the room and I'm like, look, I'm like, you got to get somebody from the club over here to change these fucking bed sheets. I'm like, that's disgusting. And she goes, okay, well, here's what you should do. She goes, find a bed, bath and beyond or something. <laughs> Get the bed sheets and the club will reimburse you. And I go, lady, I go, I'm, I'll buy the fucking fuck? Alamo. I don't have a car here. Yeah. I'm like, this <laughs> is awesome. Where's yeah. there a Bed Bath and Beyond yeah. in San Antonio? Like, I get somebody over here. I have a good week. I was the feature. Manny loved me. He loved me so much. He got me into other clubs. That's how I know it was a good week. And at the end of the week, she goes, Yeah, they're going to pass on bringing you back because you were difficult. Why? Because oh, I didn't want to sleep on dry <laughs> palm. Like, so Fucking I, diva. Yeah, and, I, and I'm going to tell you something. I spent the first, I don't want to say I wait because everything happens for a reason. The first 11 years of my career dealing with that type of mentality, the owner of the comedy club that I was working at at the time, hey, kid, I'm your manager. Get the fuck out of it. I mean, look, a lot of good came of it, but I also missed out. And it's my own fault, too, because I allowed it to happen. I missed out on really coming up with guys because my whole thing was was that I was being groomed to, to all right, you're going to move up to the next step. So you're going to host, you're going to feature, you're going to headline. But I was never really doing the showcase spots. Like, you know, I wasn't doing the comedy hang. Yeah. You know, all my friends were guys that, you know, had 20 years on me. Yeah. 15 years on me. And, and look, that that's good, too, because it can get you in places. And it makes you better. That's the other thing that, and I try to tell this to comics, too. If you surround yourself with guys that you have no business being on the same show with, you're going to get better because you're going to say, all right, I don't want to be the fucking odd man. Yeah. You know, and it that's makes what you I, write harder, work yeah. more. Yeah. And that's what I liked about like, you know, even doing Borgata. There, there was one week it was Richie Byrne. He's the warm up comic for the Dr. Oz show. An absolute killer. Hmm. Don Gavin, who's a legend. Oh, he built yeah. Boston and me. And <laughs> I started in 06. So uh, granted, I'm the opener. But I'm like, all right, like it's going to be a game of which one of these things doesn't belong. What can I do <laughs> yeah. to make sure that it's not that obvious, you know? Yeah. Definitely. So I, I think there is a switch, but you also need to have the hang and guys that you can come up with and break balls and stuff like that. So it, it, it's cool. Like I'm kind of looking at things now, and especially with the pandemic, New Jersey being non-existent, New York being non-existent, unless you want to stand on a rooftop, it is cool to travel into different pockets, meet people, and, and do, do stuff. stuff. Yeah. Rogan's trying to um, make Texas into like a, another comedy hub because well, they're open too. All, my buddy lives in Austin, and that was the big – that was right when Rogan had started his – he had announced the move, and then they started moving the stuff there. He built the studio there. He's trying they to move every fucking They were doing the Chappelle shows there. there. Yeah. Yeah. But then they all – then there was the COVID. COVID that shut it down because Chappelle tested positive for COVID, yeah, so yeah. they shut the shows back down. I don't know if they're back open now. Well, there's a club, The Creek in the Cave, and I never worked it, but it was in Long Island City, and they're reopening in Austin. And the owner of that club, I never met her. We're Facebook friends, Rebecca Trent. All I hear about is how this woman's like a, an angel. Yeah. What she, and, and I actually admired some of the stuff. Like, you know, she would put together a Thanksgiving dinner for all these comics in New York that had nowhere else to go. You know, people that either didn't have their family or they were transient, they were from another part of the country. She always did these kick-ass things and was always running into trouble. And finally, with the pandemic, like, there was an announcement, everyone was sad. And I was pissed because I was like, oh, fuck, I wanted to go check the place out. <laughs> she had to shut down, but then it was just announced that she's reopening in Austin, Texas. So I'm seeing well, a lot of that. And Austin is that kind of area where I yeah. think it would, people love going there, Yeah, you know? So I think this is going to be an interesting time for comedy. The rules are kind of changed. I still think you're going to need New York or LA as far as like hubs. Yeah. Well, where I, you can work. Cause like down here is great. Don't get me wrong, but Rob, how many places we got? We have, I mean, in this uh, area within a two and a half hour drive, you can hit the Miami improv. You can hit yeah, off the, the hook. You can hit laughing. You can hit Vasani's. If you're lucky and with traffic, you could hit McCurdy's and Coconuts. But, and then just a little bit further, side splitters. Then you get to the Tampa Celtic Improv. Rays. Uh, you can also get to the Orlando Improv. But, I mean, there's so many comics also. But, and you're only having shows the improvs Thursday are, through Saturday. Improvs are a little weird, though. I mean, you have to be invited there. You have to have a connection in there, over, especially on the East Coast. you know. Mm. But, like, you got guys like Sadman and Nadim Awad who are doing their own thing in, like, Delray, Boynton. Boca, they have like good solid rooms. They got guys like Jimmy Schubert, 
and those guys coming down that are actually like, you know, standing up and making a name for themselves. And they're managed to stay away from the improvs because yeah. like the guys that are trying to come up and try to go to the improv and stuff like that. The requirement is that if you go over there and try to do a mic, you have to bring 10 goddamn people with you. Right? I know. And you're not Don't bring... ever do that. Because if yeah. you bring once, th th it doesn't matter if you start crushing, they're always just going to see you as the, as the bringer. The I, I was very fortunate in that regard. And again, coming from the wrestling business, because I saw how kids were treated, you know, that, that went to a wrestling school and graduated, and it was like, oh, yeah, sell 30 tickets. Well, once you know that that guy sells 30 tickets... You know, even if he has a five star match two years down the line, if only nine people came to see him, you're still going to think, oh, yeah, but that one time when he sold 30 tickets. So that's the problem with that mindset. Like, you have to look at something as talent. And, and, and to be honest with you, just be, it's an old adage, but be so good they can't ignore you. If you're going up there and you're doing well night after night, or at least, you know, working your ass off, the phone's going to ring. They're going to call you. There's going to be politics, sure. There's going to be things, but then you just learn when to say no. You know, you learn when, you know, a club switches bookers and they go, oh, we're going to ask you to re-audition. Well, no, I was <laughs> I was doing great there for eight years. You know, yeah, why would I not? Because you have a new management. Yeah. Yeah. Like, sorry. You know, and then mm. and it's don't get me wrong. It's a hard thing to do because we're especially because it's look you know? for me. I don't know what you do outside of this. Like Rob, Rob runs rooms, does shows. Yeah. But this is more of a side hustle. It's mm. a way that we can make money. I enjoy it. I love doing it. I sit every day and I write and I treat it like a full-time job, but it's not paying my bills. When they come and ask you to re-audition, you go, no, I don't want to do that. Well, that's now you're risking your livelihood, your uh, income. That's how you're paying your... You know, um, you know what it is, though, too? Yeah. You can see the mindset going in. And, and again, it's... Uh, it, I don't, I don't tell anybody that they shouldn't have a hobby or they shouldn't have a side hustle. Of course, you do what you want, yeah. make money. But I do see how entertainers in general, we, we, we constantly spite ourselves. I was having this conversation with my buddy Anthony who dropped me off today, professional musician. He's playing all these different places now because there's live music everywhere here, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So we go to a place the other night. I'm not going to say the name of it because I don't want to shit on anybody. And there's this musician that is not talented, at least from the standards of what I've seen. And I know I cannot play any music. I just, <laughs> I'm a listener, right? But he's got 15 different instruments on stage. He's switching them off with each song. And then he's got a fucking violin. I was waiting for a kazoo at some point. Like he's just... <laughs> and I turned to my buddy Anthony and I go, this has to burn your ass. Because the owner of the place was like, oh, man, this guy's crushing it. And I'm like, what? And that's what I said. I go, you know why that's that mindset? Because he's getting $150. But he literally brought $5,000 worth of equipment. And he's acting like an asshole. So now when you go up there with your acoustic guitar and you can actually sing and you can actually play, it's going to be like, yeah, well, that guy brought 15 <laughs> instruments. A lot, of the, a lot of the venue owners have no idea what the hell they're doing. A lot of the bookers have no idea what they're doing. So you have to look at it from the mindset of, okay, you know, maybe this is going to be 150 bucks, 200 bucks every couple of weeks or whatever. But in the long run, where is it going to get me? And that's how you kind of have to look at things. Now, granted, sometimes that can backfire. Sometimes, you know, you could say, ah, that's not going to go anywhere, and it can wind up becoming a huge successful room. But if you have a gut feeling going in that this person knows nothing about comedy, and it, it's not going to last. Yeah. And, and I can only say that because I've seen it happen. And, you know, I'm not trying to come off like the sage wise man. I've seen that happen. <laughs> well, I mean, you've been doing it longer than I think all of us combined. Well, right? yeah, Rob I mean, it two yeah. and a half, three years. And, me I'm, at four. and I'm still me here. So maybe you shouldn't be listening <laughs> to me. So I'm just saying. Well, you've I had some that, career highlights. I think the difference, like, I when, like I, when, I, when I book a show, when I have to, like, book a host and yeah. guest spots, I have to make, like, I want to make sure it jives with the headliner and whoever the feature is. But I also know that I got to put some killers on to start the show just so it keeps that energy level up. Yeah. Like I can't have like, and if I'm going to have someone that I know is kind of weak, but I have to give them a spot, then I'm going to put them on after a very strong host and between, and between a very strong host and a very strong guest spot. Well, that's, that's part of the thing too. So where I started in Jersey, my manager guy was such a dick that he would always be like, no guest spots, no matter what. And again, I think I kind of benefited from that. Because his other thing was, no comic brings notes on my stage. And it was like, all right, because I always felt like it looked very amateur to have these guys like looking. If you're on a paid show, backing it up, I won I won this open mic tournament, right? I, I go up four times in a row having never been on stage, and I'm doing a different five minutes each night, and I keep winning, right? So now I'm cocky. My opening prize is open. My, my winning prize is opening for Jackie the Joke Band Martling three months later. Right? Oh, man. I know that's... 
He and I are Stern fans. And I've met Jackie. I've brought him in and done radio three or four times with him. So it's always cool to meet the joke man. But to go and perform on a Jackie the Joke Man show. Well, so this is where it, it, and this was the most humbling experience in my life. So, you know, I got my new hot girlfriend. I'm 22 years old. I win this open mic tournament. They give me a trophy, a hundred bucks. I'd never fucking won anything in my life. So I'm like, this is, <laughs> so now I'm opening for Jackie Martling and I show up at the Jackie Martling show. It's at the same club where I won the tournament and the owner says, all right, do five minutes. And I literally was like only five because I literally just won this tournament four times going up doing a different five each time. I get up there. He introduces me within 25 seconds. I knew this is the worst mistake of my life. <laughs> <laughs> there were people in the crowd, like dressed to the nines, doctors, lawyers. They're paying a $50 ticket to see Jackie Martling, who they've been a fan of. And this was 2006. So he was only like six years removed from, from Stern, the Stern show. Know? But he was still on Sirius too at that time. Cause that was right had, when Howard yeah. had gone to Sirius. Yeah. He had, yeah. So he, uh, <laughs> I, and I fucking ate it, man. I bombed so hard to the point where his opening line when he went up was, he goes, I was making $900,000 a year, he goes, and I said, I want a million. And they said no. And I said, well, fuck you. He goes, and now I have a train conductor opening for Because <laughs> that was my one oh, joke that saved nice. Because I used to talk about how, like, every time someone would jump in front of the train, we, the train crew, would get three paid days off. I was like, it's almost like an incentive. You know, I wish they could have a suicide hotline forward their calls for someone. So that was the, whole, that was the one joke that saved That's me. That's good. And... Yeah, and, and then I, I wound up working with him years later at a couple of theater gigs, and, and we became friends. But that that was humbling to me because it was like, wow, you have to work at this. So I'm not a big believer in the whole, you know, if I have to give guest spots. Look, I want to help young comics too, but you know what? Pay your dues at the coffee shop. you know. And then when you show that you can get by with that, maybe on a paid show where people are buying tickets. You know what I mean? Like I might go see Jim Brewer tonight. And that you know, my friends like, oh, let me see. I'm like, no, man, that's Jim Brewer. Like, I'm not. He's not gonna give me a guest spot, even though I've been there. I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. Like, I don't look. I, I don't like that whole thing. Oh, hey, throw me a spot. Like, get the fuck off. Yeah. You know. Like, now, well, let me ask you a question then. All right. So, uh, Rob had brought it up on the other side of the coast. There are there's the West Palm Improv and the okay. Miami Improv. The only way that you can even get on their stage is to be part of that open mic competition, unless you have somebody bring you in. So if you're a guy like me or a guy like Rob, I don't know if Rob has connections over there, but I haven't seen you at the West Palm. I haven't seen you nope. at the Miami Improv. Every time I've emailed, I've emailed availabilities. I haven't emailed tape, mm -hmm. but I have emailed, hey, I'd like to sign up for the contest. Hey, can you bring 10 people? I can't bring 10 people. I'm in Cape Coral. I don't know anybody on that side of the coast. All right, well, let us know when you can bring 10 people, well, then, and we'll let you on. No, because you know what's going to happen? Then Then you go, thank you very much. I mean, you don't have to say, uh, that's the other mistake, too, is that people think that these, and I was guilty of that myself. You take it personally. You go, thank you very much. That's not you know feasible for me at the moment. And then you just wait. You wait until something happens, because the reality of it is, and I had this conversation with Vic DiBattetto, too. There were, there were clubs that couldn't, Vic, they wouldn't call them back. Then bread and milk hit, and then they're throwing them money. Yeah. So, I mean, granted, the chances of going viral, you know. Very slim. Yeah, very but, slim. But if you put yourself in a position where you can make them money, they're going to call you. They don't care as much about talent as you think, meaning that if you're going to take it personally, it doesn't mean that you're not talented enough. They want to know who's going to draw yeah. and who's going to make money. And look, I don't blame them for that. And when you're the improv, you can do that. When you're Silly Sally's Comedy Club and you're some jerk off that was making pizza six months ago, <laughs> you're not going to tell me that I'm not talented enough to work your room. It's just, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Rob, you know? do you tell them that you have the biggest podcast in Cape Coral? <laughs> yes, maybe that's exactly then, what I maybe do. Maybe then they'll change your mind. Well, actually, just so you know, the way he sold this to me, which I, I was glad to be here, he sent me a message. He goes, I do a live stream for Cape Coral. So I'm thinking like, I'm like, oh, this is going to be like, good morning, Cape Coral. Oh, no, you know? I, yeah. I said from Cape Coral, uh, not I'm gonna for have, yeah, Cape I'm going to be sitting Coral. next to fucking Aunt Becky. You know? There's it's more people in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania no. watching this than there are in Cape Coral. And there you know? is probably a good chance of that. We have a lot of a big following on the radio up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I, I love stand-up, but it is frustrating man I, I not i don't know where you're at after 15 years if it still gets to you but it gets it, when you work hard and you do put the time in this weekend i drove 
six hours altogether. I mean, just you covered a lot of miles. Some weekend. guest yeah. spots, but I mean, coconuts was always good to me. I've always been able to get on there and work material but you're also, out there. You're also a talented guy that has this as a bad. I mean, look, this is a great setup, and I mean, we can joke about it being in a bedroom and stuff. My podcast capabilities are literally a blue <laughs> microphone, uh, and I'm sitting at a desk, and I'm like, oh shit, you know, like is the mirror too close to my? Face? <laughs> so, if, if, is if, the fan on? Yeah, like you know, you're a talented guy, so you just keep working it out, grinding it out, but realize that you don't need. I mean, I wasted so much time worrying about what these people thought about me. And uh, a lot of them aren't even in the business anymore. There was a guy who I used to work for. He actually lives out here now. And he had a chain of comedy clubs in Connecticut. And he Hold on one second. Okay. I, I got stories about that guy, too. <laughs> Good um, ones or bad ones? Uh, both. But uh, okay. but this guy, Fun no. Ones. like he, uh, he would hire me. And he would then he would go, oh, you know, you don't have to work blue. I'm like, well, why the fuck did you hire me? Like, that's how I work. <laughs> yeah. And his definition of blue was very different than what most normal people were. Like, I think I had said shit during my set. Like, <laughs> that's blue? Like, yeah. You know, so you just got to go up there and, and do your thing. But about that guy, I'll say his name, uh, the other guy that you mentioned. Steve Bix. Steve uh, Bix. Because I knew he ran rooms up in that area. He worked down here. For, I don't know what he's up to now, but for a while. I need you to pick up the backdrop in Rochester. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they fucking... This guy, so Steve Bix, Jesus. so there's a comedian named Chris Johnston from New Jersey, very funny guy. He actually went on tour with the Impractical Jokers, doing okay. all the arenas for them. Uh, Chris calls me up. I'm in comedy maybe seven, eight months, right? And he goes, look, he goes, there's uh, this room in Allentown, Pennsylvania called the Blue Monkey. He's like, and, <laughs> you know, because I only work the top places. And he goes, Class. Steve Bix is needs a host tonight. He goes, I'm featuring. He goes, it's only going to pay like 50 bucks, but you can ride with me. He goes, and it's good for Bix to see you. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I go there. I meet Steve. Bix. Yes. How are you? Yeah. No, <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm like, all right, nice to meet you. I'm up on stage and I see him talking to Chris and then he gets up and he leaves. And then I introduce Chris and I forget who the headliner was that night, but we wind up doing the show. And then afterwards, Bix never comes back. And I said to Chris, I go, what was that about? He goes, well, why did you tell me that you never met him? You never worked for him? I go, because I haven't. I go, that was the first time I met him. He goes, he told me that five years ago. And I go, Chris, I've been doing comedy eight months. He goes, well, he told me five years ago that he had you headlining a gig. This is how crazy <laughs> this fucking guy is. Jesus. And that you called him up on the way <laughs> and tried to hold him up for money. Like you said, like, oh, I want, you know, an extra. And I go, I go, that makes no sense. I go, I have 15 minutes. I've been doing this a couple months. Yeah. Like, I was never a headliner for him. So I call him up the next day. I get Steve Bix's number, and I'm like, hey, Mr. Bix, you have me confused for somebody else. Yeah, okay. Like he's <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Then he booked me, like, you know, for the next couple of years. He didn't have really much at that point, but the last time I saw him, I want to say it was about six or seven years ago, we were doing, like, a firehouse gig in, like, the boondocks of Jackson, New Jersey. <laughs> he insisted on hosting. I featured this guy, Paul Veneer, uh, headlined, and he's telling me, I need you to work very clean. Very clean. I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll work clean, whatever. He goes up, and he's bombing because he had no act. And he literally <laughs> had a bag, like a plastic bag of wigwam socks. Yeah. <laughs> and he fucking, after bombing for like six minutes, reaches in, pulls out the package of wigwam socks, throws them at a lady in the front row, and goes, you should put those in your bra because you have terrible tits. <laughs> And I'm like, that was the clean. Clothes. No, I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, and, and so again, you know, I was like, I'm not going to work for this guy. Yeah. Anymore because like, this is embarrassing. I had like, because I had plugged it on my Facebook. So like <laughs> yeah. this ch hot chick who I went to high school with showed up and I'm like, oh, like she thinks this is what I do. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's so you get to a point where you're like, I'd rather host trivia at a bar than do comedy <laughs> well, it's funny. for I, these jerk offs. I did. There was a room uh, that he couldn't get into. He was trying, I guess he was trying to get back into doing stand up. He moved down here. He had an injury, was rehabilitating himself. I met him up in Tampa a few years ago. Okay. We're sitting at a comedy club. The guy that runs a comedy club, uh, Egyptian guy. Okay. For some reason, he won't, he, he won't let, he won't let Steve on stage because Steve Smart didn't, man. didn't have an act. Well, Steve gets it in his head that the reason that the guy won't let him on is because he's Egyptian and hates Jews. And so he is now in the lobby of the comedy club let yelling at me about how the go. owner of the, of the place hates Jews and it's wrong. And we together should be offended. And I went, I'm not Jewish. Yeah. They said, you're looping me in. And now I look like I'm angry. And I'm going, Steve, you're going to cost me work. And I'm just sitting here trying to fucking have my dinner. If I, I can't wait because everybody's got Steve Bix stories. And I mean, I'm not going to, it's because it's not my place to tell. But there are some famous guys that even have Bix stories. 
stories. And it, it's just, oh, it's that's funny. Cool. It's funny that these guys, <laughs> like, well, I mean, that's what I love about this business too. And it shows the, the nut jobs and just the different characters. I mean, I was watching uh, comedians and cars getting coffee with Eddie Murphy, who I love and Seinfeld. And they're talking about like, King Broder from Long Island. I'm like, that guy's still book. He was still booking shows a couple of years ago. Like, okay. you know, so like some of these characters, they never disappear. And whatever. Have you, Rob, have you ever seen Greg Bates? No. Okay. Never but mind. I think that Steve guy you're talking about, I think I've met him like a couple times. If down I showed here. you a photo, you would recognize it with the cane. Steve Bates. I mean, I've always had. All right, encounters yes. with him, but yes. it was just always. There's a video on YouTube though of him <laughs> yes. where it's like it's filmed. The camera is like right in his face, and he's like, "Comedy's been very good to me. I've made a lot of money in comedy. <laughs> I'm on my, I'm on my third house. <laughs> yeah, I like. Oh, comedy's been very good to me, and it's like he's got oh. a good mustache. Oh, dude, he he's... stole my silver alert shit one day. He, always, he looks like a retired cop. He always looks like he just got like rolled in dirt, like right before he fired. <laughs> like, 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 like he was just like, I'm about to go, I'm about to go on stage yep, and they find out the good. Pummel. Yeah, good. Go, Rob, go to the picture down there and like number that one right there. Oh, this is the best. Yeah, yeah, hey, uh, yeah. Is yeah. that a howl? That's like, he stole my silver alert stuff. Oh, so you know this guy? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I did a couple of mics down here. That was his company, Comedy Blast. I'm gonna send you a check and yeah. a few pens that I've say got Comedy a, yeah, Blast. I did them at a it was at a Cava Bar in Bonita Springs. Yeah. Okay, and I had done some work. He had done some open mics before at a coffee shop here in like Cape Coral or something like that. Okay, so we go to this gig and he's on before I am, and this is after he had seen some of my stuff. I had performed it at some mics, and uh, he's. Like, he's like, oh, you're really, really funny. Let me get you. I'm going to be doing some country clubs down here, and it's going to be great, and I'm going to get you on, and you'll feature. And he's telling me what I'm going to do, and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, whatever, all right. So we go to this Kava bar like a month later, and he's down there, and then he does my Silver Alert joke before I do. And I'm like, and I'm sitting in the back and go, that's my shit. I was like, I'm, I'm so I'm just pissed. I'm stewing in the back, and like that he's stealing my shit. That he just heard a at month a ago. At a kava bar. Yeah, at a kava <laughs> bar in Bonita Springs. I don't care where it is, all right? If you start doing someone else's shit, yeah, all right, then cool. it's not cool. It's not cool. So I go, I walk it's off stage, fun. I and go. It, and it goes to show, though, that he's such a fucking moron because he probably didn't even realize. That, that to me, makes me feel like he just steals everything because it's like, like how do you do that in front of the guy? And not know like, that you did yeah. it from. That means he's stealing everything, like, in my opinion. Well, I so I got up on stage. I was like, "Hey, I'd like to." I didn't know I sold that to you. I'd like to. I, I want to thank you for doing my material before I got a chance to fucking do it. Nice. We can hobble the way the fuck out of here because I don't really give a shit about who you are anymore. And I just go off. And I you, think and, you could take. And that you've back seen. Too. And Rob, 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 <laughs> might, he is thick. Steve Bix is thick. <laughs> Rob, Rob might have seen me go off on stage before, and I went off a couple weeks ago on this girl. But like when I go a little, is that when you called her the cunt word? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, and I. <laughs> Yeah, I did. So I, it was so odd because I walked. That was my introduction. Was you called her that, and then you went, "All right," and here's Rob. As I was call, as I was calling her a cunt, I'm apologizing to the family of three directly in front of me. While this girl's over there, I'm like, I go, you know, I really just don't. I just want to call you a cunt, but I, I fucking can't right now because I'm on fucking stage. And I was like, in this family in front of me, going, I'm so sorry this is happening. And the woman, and the wife of all the three, the two guys and her, go. He goes, "It's okay. She's been that way the whole time." I was like, "Oh, fine." And I just started continuing to tear into her, just have not you, giving a fuck. Uh, Ryan, have you ever been attacked on stage? No. Uh, okay. I had a couple, I mean, situations where, again, you know, doing that home comedy club that in Jersey, which I don't even like plugging them anymore, but I uh, <laughs> I was there for so long. He would always insist on doing this late show Saturday that made no sense because be he would do an 8.30 show okay. that would be fucking packed, and we'd have to rush through it to do this 1045 show that would maybe have oh. 15 people yeah. and you know, seven of them were like comps. And I, there were a few times where, you know, a few of those situations got pretty hairy. Um, and I, you know, but like, but like what you're talking about, I, I feel like I used to be so much angrier on stage. <laughs> no, I, I mean this, like ever since I left working for them, like, like I've been such a happier person in general that I feel like my whole, not that my act has changed, but like, I don't know, man, I came up in that time where it was like, you know, Oh, you know, you got to crush hecklers. And reality is, is that if you're doing your job well, you're not going to have that many hecklers. And I don't care. There's comics out there that have made names for themselves by going, oh, yeah, watch me own this heckler. Really? If you're getting heckled that much, maybe you should consider a different career. <laughs> yeah, because like, I just keep interrupting <laughs> yeah. and thinking yeah. they're funnier than you. Yeah, like, I, you know, so 
I've I've kind of just changed my, my whole mindset on on all that shit. I just want to go up, do my time, and uh, I enjoy producing shows and, and, and booking shows because, like you were saying before, and and I loved hearing you say this because it's something that thirty year bookers don't understand. I like to put together shows that make sense, mm-hmm. that that mesh. Where you know, even if it's three headliners that I feel are at equal value, I'm like, all right, we're gonna make. It's this like being work. a DJ almost, like putting the songs together. Absolutely, that flow, right? you know, and it's like you got to know how to read a room, and, and certain rooms, mm-hmm. certain things are gonna work. There's comics that I love that I would put in certain places that I can't put in other places because I just know it's not gonna work. And what I started doing is kind of like what Rodney Dangerfield did in the '80s, and I'm not putting myself on on his level. I'm just saying in that essence of like at, at Jenks, which we talked about earlier, I call it Ryan Marr and Friends because I host it and I have two features and a headliner. They all get paid very well. And it's cool because I know, all right, I could put these two with her headlining or I could put, you know, him headlining with her opening because I know that it's going to mesh well. And why wouldn't you want to work together with someone that you like? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like I'll, I'll call these guys and I'll go like, all right, uh, I want to have you feature and... Oh, well, can I bring so-and-so with me? You know, we can ride together. Sure, you're going to save a tank of gas? Come on down. Yeah. There's this attitude in Jersey and New York with the club owners of, hey, it's my club. You're not going to tell me who to put on my stage. It's like, fuck off, you know? <laughs> and and uh, there, there's too much of that where you just see a lot of, you know, a headliner doing one act and then, you know, the feature act doing crowd work the whole time. And I'm like, who booked this shit? Yeah. <laughs> this just doesn't make it's sense. It's madness. Well, all right, let me ask you, since everything had been shut down and things are starting to reopen a little bit, what have you been, I mean, stand-up's your full-time gig. What have you been doing when it was closed? What, what so, did you do for a living and well, how do you pay your bills? So I started, I mean, I always, and I had, I made no qualms about doing it. I always drove Uber and lift because I felt like, first of all, it also gave me great stories. I love writing. So I would always love meeting people in my Uber and Lyft and sharing in their experiences and talking about it. Uh, I always, you know, dabbled in podcasting and I started doing these character videos that were so fucking dumb, but people loved them with like Snapchat filters. So I kind of started almost like a cameo type of thing where I was okay. like, look, you know, send me 25 bucks and I'll do a two minute video curtailed to what you want. Cause I had always done private roasts and things of like that, you know, nature. Um, and then with the, the wrestling stuff. So I started in the wrestling business kind of as a kid and it's kind of come full circle. Now my buddy, Tommy Fierro, he ran eighties wrestling con, which was this great convention. And we always talked about doing stuff together because I had a lot of friends that went on to WWE and stuff like that. And then finally with the, with the pandemic, he was like, we're going to do these virtual signings. That's what we started doing. We, uh, we have a hotel in Wayne, New Jersey. We fly these guys in people from all over the world. Send us. Their, stuff, their stuff that they want signed, and then you have to get it signed by the guys virtually, and then send it back. We to the send people. it back, or also too, what we do is we have the eight by tens that they just place the order like on our Facebook live chat. So I'll be sitting there with Ron Simmons; it'll be shared, and it'll be like, "Hey, go to eightieswrestlingcon.com, fill it out. We'll have them sign it for you." And it's cool because it's three hours. So I only filled in the one night. He had a host, and I filled in with Coco Beware. <laughs> and, yeah, because I had known. Are Coco. you a wrestling fan? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. I want to make yeah. sure we're all. I know all you right. are. Yeah, You're yeah. look at you. So, <laughs> and so there's this girl, Vicious Vicky, who's awesome. She does the pre-show. She's a wrestler. Okay, and I, she's probably gonna get signed because she's only been like in the last two years of her wrestling. She's already had a WWE tryout, which is like pretty unheard of. Like okay. to only from two years from when you take your first bump. She hosts the pre-show, and then I sit with these guys or girls for three hours. And it's cool. Some of them I've worked with in the past, so I have some stories to go off of. There's a chat, so someone can ask a question, I can add to it. And it basically turns into almost like a three-hour interview. With the uh, wrestlers. Yeah, like the last one we did last Monday, we had the Powers of Pain, Warlord, and Barbarian. And I had worked with Barbarian, but I had never worked with Warlord. Okay. <laughs> so it was cool to, like, get, Get them know, together. Yeah, and... and uh, I'm having so much fun with it, dude, because it doesn't even feel like What's work. the coolest that name that you really had? fun, dude. Well, so far for, I mean... For you, well, Ted DiBiase was really cool because I had never Million worked with him. Man, so. Yeah, and he had a lot of great stories. Uh, I'm really looking forward. March 8th, we're doing Wendy Richter, and that's like because <laughs> that's super rare. Okay. And a lot of people don't realize that if it weren't for her and Cindy Lauper, I mean, everybody talks about Hulk Hogan and Mr. T, and there's some truth to that. But if it weren't for her and Cindy Lauper, there would have never been WrestleMania. They would have never. They would that connection that was made with MTV. Uh, which is what led to WrestleMania for that war to settle the score. That was all Cindy Lauper, Lou Albano, and Wendy. That Rick. Goonies okay. are good enough video. Yeah, like so. You know that's going to be really cool. Um, the Godfather we have in August. So eighties wrestlingcon.com is the website. But 
you know, now it's the pimp, right? Yeah. 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 yeah I, and what's, what's being really cool about it now is that because these guys are talking about how much fun they're having doing it, we're getting a lot more other guys who are yeah. interested in doing it. That's, That's cool, awesome. Man. Yeah. Man. So I've been having fun with that. Like I literally, I, I, I just drive up to this hotel an hour from my house. Uh, you know, we, we take a COVID test because these guys are flying in from, you know, different parts of the country. And we sit there. There's like there's eight of us in a room and we just pass pictures back and forth. I get to see action figures. People send their belts, which is wild. Yeah. Like it, some of these guys like have the replicas. But then one fan from Australia like sent in. He actually paid to have like the old replica tag team title. Holy he shit. He paid like two grand and then sent it to us. And I'm like, Jesus. like The this trust is... on this fella. Yeah, no. So we uh, we have a lot of fun with it. Oh, that Mike Rotunda. Awesome. Yeah, we had him the week after DiBiase. Uh, man, that's cool. All right, so yeah, that. Bray Wyatt's dad. And yeah. you know what's weird, man? Those, um, those, like the Instagrams for classic wrestling, they have like as many followers as these cam girls. Like, well, th- so, they, there's like yeah. that loyal of a following oh. to sex and wrestling. Well, you, and you know what? I think a lot of it, I think the reason that this has been such a hit too is because of the pandemic. So, again, they were always in person signings, but now it's to a point where people are really. Uh, they're sitting home. Nostalgia is huge. I mean, Cobra Kai was the biggest show on Netflix. Yep. I love it. You know, all well, these- look at the boxing Nostalgia. matches. Tyson versus Roy Jones yeah. Jr. was the biggest match of the oh, year. And now yeah. they're talking about uh, Lennox Lewis and Evander Holyfield have both been too. asked to see if they want to fight Tyson. Nostalgia, people, for some reason, even though it's been 30, 40 years, the best wrestling for me, man, when they bring a guy back out from the old days that Without I can go, like, it brings back that, because my kid will watch it, and we'll watch it together. And the guys now are super talented. Before it used to be, how big are they? Yeah. It used to mm-hmm. be they were superhero-like human beings that were bigger than life. Now these guys are... Some of them are jacked. Some of them are scrawny or thinner, but they're all super athletic. And that's what you're watching. Is that? But I miss, like, to be honest, like when they would bring out, like if they brought out, I don't know, The Undertaker in a week from now. That's what gets me excited. Even though he's retired and he was out a bunch, it's when they bring those old guys. Bring back X-Pac, but he's got like hepatitis. (laughs) I like all that old stuff. See, I like the 80s stuff. It's great here, but then they go a little overboard right now because everyone's seeing it. They're seeing Cobra Kai success and like, that's cool. And like as wrestling fans, you're pretty much, you've been in it for life, so you know like who you want and who you want to see. But they just brought back Punky Brewster. I just saw that. For fuck's sake. I I mean, really, there's got to be limits. I mean, don't get me wrong. Soleil Moon Fry, she looks good. In 2020? Yeah. Yeah, she, I think she actually had a breast reduction because I remember being upset about that. When I about <laughs> no, because she was smoking You're like, hot. it was one of the worst days of my life. She was smoking hot. Not, not, yeah, she's seen, All right. All hey, right. you know, everybody ages differently. Yeah. yeah. It's a you diplomatic know. way. Four to ugly say. guys judging her. It's fun. Well, but right now, too, it's also a great time to be a wrestling fan. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not big into all elite wrestling AEW, but they're on TNT. And now WWE, as we see the Punky Brewster Peacock original, WWE <laughs> Network <laughs> WWE Network is a, is a part of Peacock now. Yeah. NBC. So, oh. and, what, and that's what's wild for these guys. And I love seeing that, too, because these are guys that I grew up thinking, oh, my God, they're larger than life. I had their action figures as a five-year-old. But then they're telling me how cool it is that they'll be walking in a Walmart and a 10 year old will be like, Oh my God, that's the million dollar man. Yeah. yeah. Because he's played him in the video game and he has, has the action work. figure and they'll yep. get the video games where they bring out the old characters. Yeah. Who's the coolest guy that you've ever met? Like, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say biggest name that blew you away, but yeah. guy that you watched and then was like, I don't know, became a buddy or was like uh, cool we, to you. Al snow is, uh, is, is awesome. Um, we did a couple indie shows together, and then we wound up. I did a, a, the roast of the Iron Sheik. <laughs> <laughs> there was a company called Kayfabe Commentaries that I, I have to give them a lot of credit. They really kind of changed the game of how like the wrestling shoot interview was done outside of WWE. Um, they kind of forced WWE to change their game a little bit too, and and start going. All right, we're going to need to put these good documentaries out that aren't just glossing over the negative, like because kayfabe commentaries would pay these guys to come out, and and it was before the podcast and whatnot. So they they did these roasts, and Al and I hit it off. And Al's a very funny guy. He never got into stand up, but he's like an encyclopedia of wrestling knowledge. And so he's been a guy that I always like to pick his brain. Like you know, his whole big thing. We're out one night, and you know, some fan comes over. And starts, you know, talking about work rate. You know, a typical internet wrestling fan that has no idea what he's talking about. 
And Al says, let me ask you a question. And the kid goes, what? He goes, what's the best match on WrestleMania 3? And the kid goes, Steamboat Savage. He goes, no, you fucking idiot. <laughs> he goes, Hogan and Andre was the best match at WrestleMania 3. He goes, that's what sold 93,000 tickets. He goes, and when you see the WrestleMania 3 promo or highlight reel, what do you see? You see Hogan slamming Andre, Andre. and dropping the leg. He goes, yes, Steamboat and Savage had a five-star match. He goes, but no one gives a fuck about that in the grand <laughs> scheme of things. And I love that mindset. It's the same thing that can be applied to comedy where these guys are like, oh, well, you know, that guy's a hack. Yeah, that hack just got a standing ovation. Yeah. So worry about rating your shit. Well, that's you what know? I know. The guys who are calling that guy the hack are usually the guys who are, well, my material is so, you know, well thought out and planned, and that's why maybe it's... I. We'll hear that a lot. Overly, guys who, overly thought out. Overly now. thought, <laughs> oh, my material's overly thought. They just didn't get it. You nah, know, motherfucker, you, you didn't deliver it right no. because they're going to listen and they're going to laugh. You made it sound like you were reading a thesaurus for Christ's <laughs> sakes. No one wants to fucking hear that. I don't want to listen no to No one your... wants to hear that. You know what I, you know what I like, though, as, and I hate to think of myself as like the old man or the veteran because, again, we're all in the same way. But I look at it like this, and, and Al Snow taught me this, too, in, in the wrestling aspect. It's funny how it all goes hand in hand. Al, when we were going over the match, I was managing this kid, Danny DeMonto, against him. And Al says, all right, what do you want to do out there? And Danny and I both go, sir, whatever you want. And he goes, yeah, thank you. I get it. But what do you want to do? <laughs> because Al was willing to go out there and, and take bumps and, and do that shit and put on a good show because he goes, I'm on this show. You're on this show. It doesn't matter that I've done this, this, and this. We're on the same show. So I treat comedy that way too. Yeah. And it was just so funny to me because I'm not going to shit on the kid because he is funny, but Saturday night, you were the host Friday. The host Saturday was very funny, but he had a little bit of a rough time, and he kept talking about how great the first show was, right? He was like, oh, that first show was fucking great. First show was great. <laughs> so now, at the end of the night, I'm standing next, next to the feature and headliner and the host, and I'm just standing there, and the people are walking out, and they're saying, oh, good job, thank you. And he goes, oh, yeah, you guys were great for that first show. <laughs> first show. <laughs> and I said so. I was, like, I was like, dude, I go... I go, they weren't at the fucking first show. Like, I go, don't make them feel less. I go, sometimes you have a better set on the first show. That doesn't mean that that show was better don't or that these people rained. were bad. Just, you know, let it go. But And he wasn't doing it to be a dick. Like, you could tell he just felt like, oh, my God. And look, that's the reality. If you have a killer first show, chances are your second one is not going to live up to the No, and you know what's hard? It doesn't mean anything about you. No, you but know? it's hard when you're riding that wave and you're like, you know, yeah. uh, open mic competition, you. Yeah. Oh, all right, I can oh, take yeah. anybody on. Let's go. Let's get this second show. Yep. What the fuck just happened? Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely, man. That's why I like the... There's that weird part of comedy. I like the bipolar, uh, bipolarity. Bi yeah. I can't get the word out. I Bipolarness? Like, yeah, well, how bipolar it can be because it can be <laughs> so much fun and then so humbling and then you go, all right, I got to get back to writing. Yeah. Because you can be up here and go, yeah, I'm going to write tomorrow bullshit because I set a timer. Every day I have a timer and it's 32 minutes. I sit down. I have to write. Un I don't want to be interrupted. I shut my phone off. I turn the computers off. I just sit and write for 32 minutes and then I'll go on beyond that, but I want to get 32 minutes in a day. I'll do well and I'll go, I ain't going to write tomorrow. That's not, <laughs> that's, that's, and then I, then I fucking get destroyed and I go, oh, I got to write 35 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 like minutes. That. That's very disciplined. I mean, yeah. I, I used to try to do an hour a day, but now I get to a point where it's like, you know, I have the notes app, which we all have if we have our iPhones or smartphones yep. and it's like, I'll just throw stuff in there. And, you know, sometimes I'll, 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 I'll get super high I'll sm and I'll just start putting shit in there. And then the next day I'll be like, all right, let me look at this and decipher. <laughs> See, what so I, I, use, yeah. I do a lot of writing on stage in the sense that there was a lot of, you know, bits. Like I put out a CD in 2011 um, and it was an hour long CD and it was on Sirius Radio. And it was funny to me because I had this mindset of, all right, well, now I have to write a whole new act. No, because <laughs> the reality, like, and, and I get why guys do that, but. I can understand why Louis C.K. does that because he's yeah. putting out a special. And he's got a following yeah. that's going to go and see him exactly. after that special, and then they're going to see that material. Spot on, dude. And and that's the thing. Like, there's a lot of stuff. Like, I have a show in Jersey, March 21st, uh, at this place called Bar Anticipation, that I've sold out. Like, back in February, we had 600 people. It was myself, Gabby Bryan, which was awesome. She's a great comic out of New York. She's the daughter of David Bryan, the keyboardist from Bon Jovi. Oh, okay. So he came, brought a bunch of musicians. And <laughs> we were just uh, living it up, having a great time. 600 people now yeah. okay capacity i can only sell 138 tickets so i'm like i know that of that 138 there's probably realistically going to be 75 people that were there last year i'm hosting the show this time instead of headlining it and i'm like i want to do all new shit because like they just saw me a year ago i think it looks very inauthentic for me to go up but 
you know, if I'm at the Laugh-In Comedy Cafe where no one knows who the hell I am, of course I'm going to do the shit that I know works. Yeah. It's my guest spot, and I want the owner to go, hey, I'm going to bring him back. Yeah, and hire him to work some more. Yeah, so, I, you know, you always have to have that balance. But I, I've noticed, too, that, like, there's bits on my CD that, you know, I thought were finished bits. They've been played on the radio, but I've added tags to them 10 years later. <laughs> yeah. You know? So Times like, change, yeah. yeah. But what if you don't know the difference... And it, what are you going to do? You're going to look the archives of Sirius XM Radio. It was a CD that I put out. It's not like it was out on a label or anything okay. like well, that. And a lot of the people so. that come to see you that know you yeah. want to hear the jokes that they are coming to see you for. Like if uh, a band put out an album and they went and they didn't play any of the songs on that album, they'd be like, what the f-? Well, there, there, is, there is a degree of that. So back to the Dane Cook thing, I remember seeing Dane Cook at the theater of Madison Square Garden. This was before he was actually selling out the garden itself. And... Uh, it was that Harmful of Swallowed was the big album that came in, but then Retaliation was his follow up. Which when, when did Vicious Circle? That was the one that that was when he started. That was like the third one. Okay, but it was Harmful of Swallowed was was the Comedy Central special and the CD. Then Retaliation, which was pretty big, and he was doing the theater at Madison Square Garden. And Retaliation, I want to say, came out on a Tuesday. His show was on like a Friday. So obviously, I expected that he was going to be doing some of the stuff that was on Retaliation. Yeah, I mean, the CD just came out. But Bobby Kelly, who I've gotten to work with a lot and, and I admire, I think he's Killer. probably the best comic pound for pound in the world. Uh, that's not a fat joke. Uh, <laughs> Is he on the Legion of Skanks? No, he's got uh, You Know What, Dude. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's involved with those guys, though, yeah, too. Yeah. But Bobby Kelly went out at the theater at Madison Square Garden, and he just fucking crushed for 25 minutes. I had no idea who he was. This was before Torgasm even okay. on HBO. And I'm tur- I turn to my buddy, and I go, who the fuck is this guy? He goes, I don't know. He goes, but he's great. Dane comes out. And it was literally like being at a Bon Jovi show. Like he, all the girls are fucking screaming. And then he started doing that car alarm bit that he did about like, yeah, the mm-hmm. car alarm. Hello, I'm a car. He held the microphone out to the audience and the theater at Garden, I think holds 3000 because the arena itself holds 16. People were standing up reciting it back to him. And I go, holy shit. I go, this is like box. dice nursery rhymes. Yeah. Level. Yep. This is yeah. Better. This but what, different. some jerk-off comic that fucking makes 30 grand a year is going to go, oh, this hack. It's all this joke. You know, like, so yeah. it, you always got to walk that line, man, you know? Yeah. And and that's why I don't really like to shit on any comic. Honestly, I don't, because it's... Yeah, to me, once you prove that you belong doing it, you're in and you're a comic. I don't... I, I never understood... Like, there's all these comics that want to fucking review. Oh, I watched so-and-so's Netflix special and I felt... Yeah, well, he has a Netflix special. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe you should stop feeling and start writing. Let know? me ask... All right, well, uh, before I ask... And I'll ask Rob first and then you. Uh, where are you at goal-wise for comedy? I'll start. getting tape. It's weird to be at that point, but I've been doing it for four years and I still don't feel like I have that good tape to go send to bookers. I still get booked a feature without that tape, but I'd like to have that tape so I can go, here's 10 minutes of me doing super, I, but it's never every show. I always get done and I go, that's not the one. Every mm. single show. And it may just be one joke doesn't get that laugh, but it's it's like when, when you surf, I, I don't know if you, Grew up surfing. I grew up in no. Jersey. Look at this up, body. Yeah. You think I grew up surfing? Well, look at this body, too. This is actually meant for surfing. Fat and I can paddle. I'm it looks uh, like a fucking buoyant. movie over there. Yeah, <laughs> buoyant. Fuck you. Uh, <laughs> but it, wait, when you surf, my uncle used to be this way. He would sit and wait for the perfect wave. And he'd be out there all day. He'd wait three hours and catch one wave. But he'd catch the right one and it'd be good. But he'd give up all of those other opportunities to catch the same wave for that, for that one wave. And that's how I feel about this tape. I keep having good sets, but I'm in search of that perfect set Damn. that I can have and send out to bookers. I, I would say don't overthink it because, you know, the reality, I, I did a, a, a reality show where I filmed like an eight minute set. I used that for a little bit and then I would watch it and go, well, I don't even think this is funny anymore. <laughs> and then, you know, I, there's a clip that I send out now and I think I opened with the joke on Friday night. It, it's literally me doing an Elks Lodge in my hometown, but they had a nice stage set up and I just threw my iPhone and I get the big reaction because I talked about how the woman in the audience thought I was Toby from This Is Us. Okay. And I and I do that bit, and it gets a huge reaction. And then I go into something else. And then I did have a heckler video, which I think was on my Instagram that was from a year ago. I send that out. I'm at a point now where it's like, you know what? I just want to show these people that I can work in any situation. So I even put together like a reel that's 10 minutes of a couple different shows because I'm like – you know, I feel like it's a good idea. You know, sizzle reels. Yeah, because I want I want them to go. Oh wow, this kid can do a VFW hall. Because a lot of these clubs don't forget they're booking private, you know, off off site stuff where they <laughs> go. You know, oh hi, I'm calling off the hook comedy club because I need 
a guy to do this PTA fundraiser. Oh, okay, well, we have this guy. He's got a background in doing those. That's how you get yourself work. And so to answer your question about my goal, I just want to keep working. I think I used to want the fame thing. Um, but now I'm like, yeah, whatever. I mean, like I'm really enjoying doing this wrestling shit again because it's, it's really come full circle. Awesome. It's almost like the, like a sign, and I've never really been an overly spiritual person, but like even when I went I went to a Catholic high school, my, my freshman year teacher, he goes, oh, my son's a professional wrestler. And then I wound up meeting his son like at a show a couple weeks later, and then we became friends. And it's like, so I always get sucked back into it somehow. Okay. So I'm just like, whatever, man. I just want to ride the wave, be happy, make people laugh. And if I can pay my bills along the way, you know, not to sound like a, a, a burnout, but you just get to a point where you're like, this is the only thing I'm good at doing, so I'm just going to keep, keep doing, doing it. Keep doing it. That's yeah. how I feel about radio. I bounce yeah. around the country <laughs> doing it, but it's the only thing I really have ever known how to do, and I do it well. So I go, yeah. I'll just keep bouncing around. Churchill, what's your goal? Uh, right now, it's just to make sure I get, like, I just want a feature. I want a feature. I want to have a good, strong, really, really great 25. And I'm like... I'm probably like six or seven minutes away from that right now. And so I'm writing a lot more. But the whole thing with me is when I started doing this, like I didn't have any idea how to write. Like yeah. I'm still working on how I write personally, yeah. myself. You know, that's been always, that's been my thing for the last, like, I don't know, seven, eight months. It's just figuring out my writing style. So even in the last couple of weeks, I've written like 15 minutes worth of material. I've tried out eight or nine minutes of it on stage and it's worked. It's done really well. You know, but it's it's got to get better. So I just want to I just want to get my twenty five feature because like I do I have a real full time job that I have I go to every day. And, Two kids, and, and, but it's honestly I spent. Caitlin gets mad at me when I spend all day in here thinking about stand up, <laughs> and then when I'm not working, I'm going all right. Well, how can I get to be working? What can I do? And that's why I'll run I run rooms like the fucking Elks Lodges. I'll do we have golf course. I have a whole stage and a setup. So we'll go in and actually turn. I got uh, banners and all the backdrops that you talked about with yeah. Bix having. So I'll go in and I'll try and make it look like it's a pop up comedy club for the evening. And there's enough little retirement communities down here, golf courses. Like when you guys leave, my next agenda is calling the rest of the communities, uh, the 55 and over communities. I didn't call on Friday and pitching it to them. It's a hustle, but it's fun. If you but now what? Now let me ask you that though. So now, how do you curtail that? So if you get one, for yeah. example, are you putting in acts that are going to relate to that crowd, or are you going to go? You know what? We're going to do six comics. No, go no. It's usually a, always a headliner, always a feature act, and then I only host. Okay. I go up and I host because I know yeah. these are mostly communities that are fifty-five and over. My like, and I love Rob. I do, and I want to have him feature. And I've told him as soon as you have twenty-five minutes of yeah. you know PG thirteen-ish material, let's go. And not that it's dirty, but we need. I had to have cleaner comics for these rooms because it is. There was a Elks Lodge that we're running. You couldn't say goddamn. Because yeah. it's the Bible it's Belt. Yeah. It's the oldest county in all of Florida. But I get, I mean, there's a lot enough headliners down this area that you can get guys who you see at the clubs who have an off weekend who are going to do a good job yeah. that will then Nathan parlay Wallace it. is great at that, man. Well, he's a good feature, but there's plenty of good headliners. Tim the Dairy Farmer, just guys, Mike Rivera. That's there's right. guys from this area. Jamie Morgan. Yeah, I, well, I always tell people, too, you know. Like is you Jamie were considered the clean? It's just a comic. I'm oh, talking yeah, about good yeah. comics. We'll talk. We'll talk later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, but but I always say too, like you know, the problem now. You were saying the 25 minutes. It, once you get the 25 minutes of material that you feel, don't be afraid of doing a little bit of crowd work because you could stretch it out. I always say to people, if you want to be a solid feature, have 40 minutes of material because you never know when a curveball is going to be thrown your way. And I say, if you're going to headline, you have to have minimum an hour, and. Because you never know, you might have to change gears while you're up there, and I've had to do it. And to be honest with you, as someone who has you know, been a headliner that's worked catch and headlined in Vegas and Reno and stuff like that, I, not that I would turn it down, but if, if someone called me right now and said, you know, next Saturday, do an hour, I'm going to have a little angst about it. I'm yeah. going to be like, all right. I get to do 25 you know, at the end of the month. Yeah. That's, so that's it's my like, target right now. I have 25 at the end of the month, but I'm a host. Yeah, that's what I do. I exactly. host. Exactly. Well, see, so you already have the the right mindset, you know, and, and when I first started quote unquote headlining, you know, I would say like a perfect example, Mike Racine is doing my show August 21st bar. He's got a comedy central half hour special. And I, and, and I remember saying to him a couple of years ago, we worked something together at the Friars and I was like, look, man, I, I've got some work for you. I go, but you have a, you have a half hour special. I'm like, are you okay? He was like, yeah, man, fuck it. 
I'll do it. You know, and, and that's, and that's the, the mindset that you need to have. So now with this pandemic, and again, I don't care who you are, this pandemic has affected you in some way. So a lot of people are doing that whole sit in the room, thinking about their dreams. I've had more people approach me about getting into comedy since the pandemic than ever before. before. And yeah. I, and I used yeah. to teach a, a writing workshop. So and I say to them, I go, listen, I am not the one yeah. <laughs> to tell you because I don't know what the hell I'm doing when it, when I get out of this. And there's actually somebody who sent me a clip, and, and I get it. They were like, hey, when you know this gets back to normal, we open back up, I want to work for you. I said, yeah, send me a clip. The clip was all Zoom shows. And I said, do you have anything from – he goes, oh, no, I've never been on stage. <laughs> and, I'm like, and, and I'm telling you, you laugh, but that's what, that's what you're going to see. Yeah. There's all these that was people me. now. I'm sorry. There are these folks that are, that are doing six, seven, eight Zoom shows a week. They're calling themselves comics, and they're in for a rude awakening. And I hope that a lot of them stick with it because obviously that's the dream. I don't think anyone ever dreamt of sitting in their living room and, and talking well, to a computer Well, screen. they're used to silence right now, Fuck. so it'll be very effective yeah. when they get on stage. Okay, so it'll be very effective. But I'm like, you know, I thought I thought my open mic to Jackie Martling transition was bad. I'm like, wait till these fucking people. You know, Can I ask, have you ever been invited to Jokeland? I know you said you developed yeah, a relationship. Yeah, have you I, been to the world yeah, famous Jokeland uh, in Bayville? Do, 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 no, no, never there. I I oh. done his show on Sirius though uh, years back, and uh, then we actually it can't kind of came full circle. We did a, a theater in LBI, the Surflight. Okay. Uh, we did that together a couple of years ago and he took me to dinner afterwards. So, I mean, we developed a little bit of a relationship, but I wouldn't say we were, you know, like close friends, but he's a great guy. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a funny journey. Every time I see him, like I bring that up, yeah, that, like how, at, how bad I ate it <laughs> in front of you the first time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but the, it's the stories like that, that I was like, I was working with Gilbert Godfrey quite a bit too. And we did like Love a it. bunch of gigs and then he got comfortable around me. And it was weird because what you see on stage and in interviews is not how he talks. It's not, you know, he's actually a very quiet. Receptor. Yeah. I've oh, hi. How are you? Had him in for radio. Very yeah. like just not fragile, but you're like, yeah. Oh, look, it's Gilbert. <laughs> like that's how, <laughs> but he'll instantly turn it on. And we were doing a, a the Meadowlands racetrack up in like right by giant stadium. And, you know, we're in this like green room and, and the chef comes in and goes, Oh, Mr. Gottfried, I want to personally give you this, you know, I'm a huge fan. And, you know, Gilbert went from just being, like, nice, mild, better, oh, yeah, whatever. And then this guy walks in, and he says that, and Gilbert looks up. He's like, I hope you didn't jerk off in my salad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what the fuck, like, that's fucking yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, but I think Gilbert, Gilbert knows that's what the people expect. So yeah. it's, he yeah. turns it on and on. That's so yeah. cool. All right, well, listen, uh, this has been fun. I, we got to wrap so up. Fun. Rob, anything that you would like to promote? Uh, let me see. We just got the open mic this week at Laugh-In on Wednesday night. Make sure you guys come on We down. never talked about and... my goals. No, because we don't know. We don't I, have I, any. Yeah, no, yeah. We don't have any. It's here. And, uh, <laughs> You've reached the pinnacle. Flip Schultz this weekend oh, okay. at um at Laughing uh, Thursday through Saturday, and uh, I'm trying. Oh, and Brent Ernst is up at uh, Vasani this weekend. He's so a fucking killer. I got some killers up there. I got some killers down here. So where if you're in the area, wherever you are, make sure you go see some live comedy because you all need it. Y'all need it bad. Uh, Ryan, uh, anything you'd like to promote besides wrestling? What is it? 80s Wrestling Con? It's 80swrestlingcon.com, but I, I always tell people, follow me on good. Instagram, at Ryan Mar Comedy, Ryan, M-A-H-E-R Comedy. I, I take a lot of like the jokes that I wrote on face, right on Facebook. I put them up in my Instagram story. Uh, yeah, and uh, like I said, I mean, I, I've got a lot of friends down in this area, uh, so I'm going to start probably coming down here a little bit here and there cool. until... Uh, Shit gets back, you know, and even if shit does get back to normal, it's always good to just have places to go, man. I've always loved Florida. I've loved the weather. I like the people. So, it's yeah, hopefully I'll uh, I'll be working with all you guys a little more. It's, it's been a lot of fun down here since we reopened May 9th, but it's amazing the number of comics that have all of a sudden popped out of the woodwork. Yeah. It's fucking amazing. Yeah, you but know? you know what? I mean, again, be so good, you know. If yeah, you, that if, they can't tell you no. Yeah, mm -hmm. if, 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 you're do, if you're doing the work, you know, let them call you. I mean, it, it, that's the thing. It's gonna, I like that, though. It's going to weed out people that have just been taking up stage time. That Have you, uh, before I let you go, uh, you mentioned doing danger fields. Mm -hmm. Are we getting past there? Did you ever get to meet Rodney himself? No. So Rodney died in what? I think 04. I started you, comedy in 06. Okay. Oh. But my thing with danger fields was too, it was just like any of that city grind, unless you could line up four or five spots in one night, it wasn't really worth it because I was paying gas and tolls to get there. But there was one night at danger fields where I was just bombing and, um, a couple guys before me had gone up and bombed, and I couldn't even blame the crowd, though, because then this guy, Keith Anthony, went up afterwards and just destroyed. Keith always destroyed. But I remember Tony, the owner, who had passed me, he walked up the stairs because he would always sit downstairs in the office, and I guess after a while, if he was hearing silence, he would come up and look, 
And when I saw him come up and give me the look, I was like, fuck, I don't think I'm going to be here again. <laughs> and, and, uh, and like, I, I, I didn't get a call for like three months. And I used to get like, you know, two, three spots a week. And then three months later, it was so weird. But that's, again, the no rhyme or reason to this business. So they shelf me for three months. And then they call me and they go, you want to host this weekend? Which was like a huge promotion. Yeah. Like, you know, because it was like, oh, wow, $150 to host instead of, you know, 25 or 50 to do a spot. All right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and then like I was kind of back in. And that's why you just learn to roll with the punches with this business because none of it makes any fucking sense. Well, I think 2020, I was telling my buddy and I were talking yesterday. He worked for Live Nation out in Austin. Okay. Had a great job. Literally knew, like we, everybody knew, okay, shit's fucked up. This is going to be weird. He knew things weren't going back to normal when they canceled South by Southwest because yeah. that was the bread and butter all year round. They're building towards that weekend. And he called me. He goes, I'm going to be out of a job soon. I don't know when, but it's going to. And then so his life went from work. He worked his way up to like a, a concert promoter within Live Nation, was doing really well, gets laid off. And now he's buying things at pawn shops and turning around and selling them for a profit. And he goes, look, it's not what I was doing before. I'm not making what I was making before, but I'm happy doing it. Yeah. I like doing, I'm making money. And he was like, you know what? The one thing that I learned in 2020 was that you can't plan. The shit's going to go sideways. Just like you said with stand up, it's you, you can't, if you're going to go up there with 25 minutes and you have to feature and you only have 25, you're going to yeah. be fucked. Cause things can get a curveball can be thrown at any point. Here's how I'm looking at it too. I mean, cause I'm, I, I also, I dropped like 40 something pounds. I'm trying to lose more, but like, I, I can't deal with the fucking cold anymore. And that, that <laughs> even when I was fat, I, I, I just couldn't handle the cold each year. It got worse. Tough. I'm looking at a situation now where I just like, I call my friends, Beth and Anthony up and I'll just be like, Hey, I want to come down. And then, you know, I'll hit you guys up if you got the spots. And if it pays, fuck it. Great. That's Living how I'm looking the dream. at it. That's honestly how I'm looking at it. Because it's like, what am I going to do? Like, you know, as long as I can be home to do the shit that I need to do with these wrestling signings and whatnot and, and, and promote my own shows in Jersey, fine. But, like, really, what's what's stopping me from doing that, you know? I was always doing, living out of a suitcase anyway. Yeah. You know? A lot of the clubs, even pre-pandemic, were shutting down. You know, uh, City Steam in Hartford, which in my opinion was aesthetically the nicest comedy club in the country. I mean, just fucking awesome. Gone, you know, before the pandemic. So you say to yourself, this business boomed out of bars and restaurants. Granted, the dynamics have changed with social media, whatever. But again, if you're that good, you're just going to keep working. So. Why do you think those are, uh, you think it's overexposure now? People have Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. So why do yeah. I need to go to the club when I can just watch this? Is that why there was a decline towards the end before the pandemic? Yeah, and it's not just comedy. I mean, it's it's everything. It's it's trends. Like Again, the people who I'm staying with, I mean, he was in a band, a cover band called The Benjamins, and they were sponsored by Coors Light. They were making, each member was making over six figures to be a cover band. <laughs> they, had, they were an nice. original band, but they, they got latched into this cover band circuit and- you know, Jersey, the rock clubs, I'm talking from like, you know, I turned 21 in 2004, but I had heard about it from the 90s and it lasted up until 08. I mean, there were these killer rock clubs where bands that were cover bands would bring in a thousand people to these rock clubs. Yeah. And it was just huge. And then all of a sudden, MySpace hit. And then it was like, oh, well, we're going to, you know, MySpace was huge. And people discredit MySpace a lot, but it was very huge, especially for music. And then we went into. Facebook. And now what we're dealing with too, you asked earlier about social media is that, you know, it's the cancel culture thing. Like now guys that are 40 are guys that grew up on social media doing all the bonehead shit and stuff like that. Yeah. And now everyone's a little more reserved, a little <laughs> more whatever. So things change and things evolve. It's just now with technology constantly, you know, evolving at, at, at a huge rate, mm -hmm. people, uh, you know, aren't going out as much. They're yeah. not. And again, and when you have ever, I mean, my TV, why would I, go, uh, and I liked going to the movies before. Yeah. I did. It was fun. And now I've gotten accustomed to sitting at home watching the TV yeah. and I can watch the latest movies. On t they're skipping, like there's, uh, was it Universal that's skipping going to the movie theaters directly and I going straight so, yeah. to home delivery. So yeah. it's like, you know what? Yeah. They're cutting out the middleman altogether. But it, I was reading about the Golden Globes last night. I didn't watch it. I'm like, oh, oh shit, no. Nomad, Nomadland? I'm like, I just watched that on Hulu the other night. For free. <laughs> yeah. And they're saying, like, that's going to clean up and win, like, best picture at the Oscars. I'm like, oh, that's wild to me. Yeah. That, like, you know, it's just a different world. All right. Well, listen, it was uh, fun having you in. So much fun. Uh, 80sWrestlingCon.com. Yeah, check Ryan that out. But Mar Ryan Comedy. Ryan Mar Comedy. Ryan, sure. M-A-H-E-R Comedy on Instagram. And, uh, yeah, man, let's just uh, keep doing the dick jokes and... <laughs> Paying the bills. Uh, Churchill, any, what's your social? 
Uh, Rock Golf. You can find me at Rock Golf on Instagram. Rock R O C G O L F. All right. And uh, that is it for us. We'll be back Wednesday. I have air conditioning again, so we'll definitely <laughs> yeah. do this on Wednesday. <laughs> nice. And uh, joining us on Wednesday will be Stacy Steele. And uh, Rob, if next, I know you're off. And Steve Bix. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Rob, if you're free next week, please let me know. I'd love to have you back on yep. a Monday. I'll be uh, I'll be around, I think, uh, maybe. I don't All know. Right, cool. Check. Well, thank out. you very much I'll for coming, out. Ryan. Uh, TJ, thanks for sitting there. No problem. Appreciate it. You did a lot. And uh, we'll be back <laughs> Wednesday at 11 a.m. Until then, uh, see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.